Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Not yet, not yet. There we go, all right. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, now that I'm here in the south, would a hearty how y'all doing be more appropriate? My name is uh, Frederik Bohn. Uh, I'm the director of corporate partnerships, uh, and I couldn't be more thrilled uh, to be here and be your MC for the day. Um, we are very excited um, to be here and see such a great turnout. Um, this is actually my first time here in the region. The accent might have given it away. I'm originally from Germany. I uh, have been here in Northwest Arkansas for now uh, a little over 48 hours, and I gotta say, I really, really love it. Um, especially with such a great turnout, with the local community coming together, entrepreneurs from around the country, corporate innovators, and also VCs. Uh, we're here today uh, to celebrate uh, at our Spring Expo uh, entrepreneurial achievements, uh, innovation, pilot success stories, um, and yeah, startups and corporates working together. Uh, before we dive into all of the content for the day, though, uh, please allow me to welcome my dear colleague and friend, uh, Josh Saffron, up on stage. Hello, Frederick. How are you? Very good. Good to see you, Josh. Now, for the folks in the room who don't know you yet, uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Josh Saffron. I am the director of Plug and Play here in Northwest Arkansas. I've been in the supplier community for about the last 25 years, the last 11 here in Northwest Arkansas calling on Walmart. And I have a very long track record here with Plug and Play for three weeks and one day. <laughs> now, Josh, uh, out of the former supplier lens in the CPG space, uh, what would keep you up at night? What would be top of mind right now when it comes to the supply chain space? So since we were last together in 2020, there, as you guys know, has been tremendous amount of supply chain disruption. Costs have escalated all across the entire supply chain, whether that's the cost for ocean containers going up from $3,000 to almost $30,000, the cost for freight. Uh, it's been very hard to get uh, ships out of the port. And most importantly, the consumer has changed the way that they shop. So the move to omnichannel from brick and mortar has been so quick. And as we know, the shopper wants their product on time and in full when they want it and where they want it. So, but just don't take my word for it because I've only been here for three weeks. I want to put up a slide here for a Please. CEO of a $10 billion company. So this was on LinkedIn two weeks ago. CEO, $10 billion company, huge business with the number one and number two retailers in the world. And he's talking specifically about how bad the supply chain is and how much worse it's going to get this year. He's talking about things like the length of time it is, takes to get stuff here. Um, most importantly, he's joking at the end, maybe it's time for me to retire. So he's not talking about branding. He's not talking about retail. He's not talking about his P&L. He's talking about the need for innovation and to fix the supply chain in the world that we're living in. Hashtag supply chain. Hashtag retailers be aware. So now is the time to address supply chain innovation. If we're still doing supply chain the way we did pre-COVID, we're all going to lose. And the end, day, end game is the consumer's going to lose. So we need innovation to get your product into the hands of your consumers, our consumers, when they want and where they want. And that's why we're so excited to be here today, plug and play, taking you into the next phase of this. Well said. Couldn't have done it better. Um, before we jump into the agenda, covering all the topics of supply chain innovation and how our corporate partners have worked with one another, I would like to actually uh, take a moment and thank uh, our partners here in the community uh, on the next slide who have brought us uh, to Northwest Arkansas 
and have worked with these startups and have really been embracing the concept of open innovation. So uh, please, a quick round of applause uh, for you all on this one. And uh, of course, we're excited to keep on growing this ecosystem uh, and hopefully we'll add uh, many more uh, members to this very soon. Now, let's take a look uh, at the agenda. Uh, in just a moment here, uh, we'll be kicking things off with our very own uh, Saeed Amidi, CEO and founder of Plug and Play. Uh, then we'll hear from Mike Zeons, the partner of the newly raised uh, supply chain fund. We'll have uh, the keynote of the day. We'll have three panels on sustainability, economic uh, development, uh, as well as the future of trucking. And of course, we will have startup pitches. Um, some quick housekeeping. On the next slide, you'll see the QR code. Uh, please uh, take a moment, if you haven't done so already, at check-in to scan this. Uh, it will give you access to the digital booklet with information on the agenda and, and much, much more. So um, it will also be around, um, and some printouts are around the room as well. Um, with that, I'd say, Josh, do the honor. So it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome our CEO and founder, Saeed Amidi, to the stage. Great to see you, Josh. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. It was almost uh, to the date two years ago, a little bit two years and some months, that we launched this program. And I remember I promised a lot. We're going to have events every month. We're going to have events every week. And then COVID happened. But it is really fun to see people, to meet people, you know, shake hands and hopefully build new relationships and help the supply chain challenges that we are facing. You know, I do know some of you, can you tell me how many of you know a little bit about plug and play? About half. <laughs> uh, but what we intend to do is uh, connect people around the world. This is mostly entrepreneurs, but we connect them to investors, to corporate partner, to accelerate the pace of innovation. And the main product is technology. We think technology can solve any problem in the world, and we also feel there is smart people everywhere. So we just have to enable them, define the challenges we have, and then enable them to build their products to solve those challenges. We've been able to do this, uh, do this in FinTech, in tech, mobility, and now here in supply chain. And again, my favorite new division is sustainability and reducing the carbon footprint. We are trying to apply what made Silicon Valley have Twitter. You guys have heard of Twitter, do you know? <laughs> it was a big news today. Tesla, I think you also have heard of Tesla and Elon. And then Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, to name a few. You know, the, the, the main reason why six out of the Apple as well is there, the reason that six out of the 10 biggest technology companies are in Silicon Valley, in my opinion, is the culture that is there. The culture of it's okay to fail. In fact, we have a company called Credit Sesame that it, this is the third time I you know, seed funded the founder. He better make it this time. <laughs> <laughs> I will not fund him the fourth time. No, but joking aside, it is really believing that you can build a great company, dreaming big, and then having the funding to do it, and then implementation. And, you know, plug and play, we think we are the largest innovation platform in the world. And to kind of give you some numbers, in 2021, we accelerated over 2,000 startups, and we invested in 210 of them. 
and then really prayed a lot for them <laughs> to go up in value. But we could not do this alone. You know, we love our corporate partners. We have about 547 corporate partner, you know, including the, some of the biggest corporations in the world. And we actually start with their challenges. May it be like customer acquisition, omni-channel. We just say, how could a technology startup help you solve your challenges to either, either have better customer service or reduce cost and create value. And again, we've been able to do this with BMP Paribas in Paris. We've been able to do it with Mercedes in Stuttgart. And really, we intend to multiply our activity here in Bentonsville, not only with supply chain, but with sustainability and possibly health. But why do we do this? It's a good reason. You know, we sort of bring all of these startups, connect them to cooperation. It's really to find the next unicorn. It took us about 15 years to have 15 unicorns, and I feel kind of privileged to be part of some of these entrepreneurs' journey. N26 out of Berlin is uh, worth $10 billion. And about nine years ago, I gave Valentino and Maximilian 25,000 euro for 5% equity. Then I helped them raise $1.5 million from Early Bird. And then Peter Till of PayPal came to Berlin and gave them $10 million at 50 million valuation. And then I thought my job is finished. And now they are, I would say, the number one startup in Europe, uh, employing over 2,000 people and growing. And actually, it was the second highest value bank after Deutsche Bank in Germany. And uh, it started less than 10 years ago. To share some other one, you know, Flutter Wave is started in gig economy in Africa for payments to give to these, uh, you know, drivers, delivery people. But they built the most robust rails for money transfer, and now the banks use them in South Africa. And it's now worth $3 billion. So I kind of get a kick out of the founder after he graduated from Berkeley to have three months stop at plug and play before going to Nigeria to start his company. Again, I don't want to bore you. Maybe Block Damian will be the last one I tell you. So who, who has Bitcoins? Who has cryptocurrency? Sure. I have five Bitcoins. <laughs> 10 years ago, we had a Bitcoin meetup like today, and I took Bitcoin as a coffee sales, and my five Bitcoins are from my coffee sales from our cafeteria. But people think crypto is really going to be the underlying uh, basis of smart contract, money transfer. And everybody, at least in Silicon Valley, thinks you know 5% of everybody's assets should be in some sort of digital form. And uh, again, I am still learning that. I don't believe that. I don't have, that's why I only have five crypto, but five Bitcoins. But anyhow, the part that I wanted to share with you, it really gives me and plug and play team a great joy to see this, each one of these startups to be successful and being part of the game, not only how many people watched WeWork and Uber on TV, the series. So it's so funny, like I know half of the characters in those movies, like David Drummond 
from Google. So it's good to be part of the film or part of the game rather than just watching it. But why are we here, and this is my last slide, really we would love to, with your help, with the corporate people, with the startups, with the community, build this innovation platform in Northwest Arkansas and really bring a lot of technology startups in supply chain, in sustainability, and in health to have roots here and diversify the economy and grow the economy. And again, I cannot tell you how pleased I am that we are not doing this in Zoom, nothing against Zoom, <laughs> but uh, it is great to have you here and I hope you will enjoy the day. Thank you. And, and my partner in crime, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Saeed. I've lost a bit of my voice networking, but great to be back here in Arkansas uh, we are for another big event. The last event we had in Arkansas, Saeed kissed me on the cheek because we signed Walmart, because he's been asking us for to sign Walmart forever. But we're super happy to have this office here. This is going on year three of our partnership. It's been a great accelerator program here in, in Bentonville. Uh, we are very proud and grateful for a lot of the folks in the community here from the university uh, to Nelson Peacock, who signed the agreement with us from the North, uh, Northwest Arkansas Council. Uh, to also Chris Saltemeyer, who used to run logistics at Walmart and is a, an advisor for plug and play. Uh, to all kind of help us to be part of this community here. So uh, we've had a pretty meaningful impact, we think, and we're excited to uh, expand and do other areas outside of supply chain as well. Uh, so, so these are just a little, I'll just go through a few slides on plug and play, uh, but we really do three things. We have our startup programs, we have corporate innovation, where we work with about 500 large corporations like Walmart, Tyson Foods, and J.B. Hunt. And then we have our ventures activities where we actually invest directly into the startups. Uh, the main focus for this program so far in Arkansas has been supply chain, which touches a lot of different sectors. But we are active in plug and play in pretty much every sector, as you can see. And then these are the offices in yellow that are actually focusing on supply chain. So we have dedicated teams like you see here on the ground. They're able to accelerate and work with startups every day and be able to connect them to the global market but also uh, bring startups like from Singapore or Shanghai to the United States or from Europe uh, to Canada, for example, if they're targeting those specific markets. So we love being that global connective matchmaker between corporates and startups and enabling them to do business and, and pilot uh, with each other's technology. Uh, so, uh, okay. So these are just uh, the partners in the supply chain program. As you can see, we work uh, with a holistic uh, view of different corporate partners from the end-to-end -end supply chain. So since starting the supply chain program back in 2017, uh, which we built the vision for actually with Maersk, who is here today, and then quickly that's when we contacted Chris Saltemeyer and he ended up uh, building support for Walmart, uh, we were able to partner with all these different industry players in every mode of transportation, uh, including the largest warehouse owners like Prologis, the largest postal services and parcel delivery players, uh, to the largest uh, mining companies and, and energy companies like ExxonMobil or Shell. So we believe that if we can connect these startups to the large players in the industry, it's an amazing due diligence process for us at Plug and Play, but it's also very valuable for the corporate partners to know that their peers in the industry are actually testing and working with different startup companies. So we want to be able to connect our corporate partners to the top startups in the world and be able to fly them to places like here where they can actually work with our corporate partners. You can see these are just some numbers on the program. So we've done five batches so far, so you'll hear from some, some of the startups today and some of the different panels. Uh, we've accelerated and eva or evaluated 256 startups and accelerated 57 in the program. Nine of these have actually turned into commercial implementations, and you'll hear from some major success stories like Platform Science, who's rolled out uh, with the fleet of Walmart through attending events like this. So you'll hear from Jake, one of the founders, uh, in a little bit. 
to quite a few others that have had other major commercial implementations. But we're very grateful to the top members in the community here, like Walmart, Tyson, and JB Hunt, but also especially to the university and all the community partners, and like the Walton Family Foundation, who's very pro uh, supporting startups in this uh, whole community. You can see these are just some of the startups that have gone through the program. There's been, as I mentioned, some great success stories like Ocean Insights, which was acquired by Project 44, which also is uh, attended our events and is here today. Uh, we, I just talked about platform science and, and strong arm tech, which is another big success for, story for Walmart. Uh, but we could go into all these different examples, like even Gaddick, who's uh, now in one of the lanes here in Bentonville. But we're very proud to bring these startups from around the world to Arkansas and enable them to actually test and, and be able to work with our large corporate partners. And last and most excitingly, we're especially grateful to this community here for the newest fund that we just announced uh, a few weeks ago. So we raised 25.5 million uh, for a new supply chain fund. And one of our core investors is uh, representing uh, RZC Investments, which is uh, basically this building here, which is uh, through Tom and Stuart Walton. Uh, so we're very grateful for their support and as well as many other LPs uh, here today, and many of our corporate partners are able to support this in this new initiative. So traditionally, plug and play would invest from our family office, where you'd write small checks, uh, 100K, 200K into startups. But now we can also invest not just in pre-seed and seed rounds, but also series A, B, and C in supply chain startups. So any startup we see here today, we're excited to be able to participate with other leading investors, and we're excited to take this next step in our journey together. Uh, so this is just a little bit about the fund. We're looking at the end-to-end -end supply chain, just like our program. And we've invested and can announce three startups, uh, which are here. Einride, which is an electric autonomous truck that has performed incredibly since we first invested. Rapid Ford in the cybersecurity space. And then Oloid, which is able to uh, detect different people for security purposes as they're entering manufacturing sites or different warehouses. So we're excited to invest more in, into great startups uh, that are here today and fly them in so they can also try to work with our corporate partners uh, in the industry. But I'll, I'll stop there. That's it for my presentation. We were supposed to hear next from John Ferner, the president of Walmart US. He, emer an emergency came up, so he couldn't make it today, but he did make a video for us, so you can hear from him uh, just now in the video. Thank you so much, everyone. We're so excited uh, to be back here in person in Arkansas. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Plug and Play Northwest Arkansas Expo. Now, if this is your first time here in, in Arkansas or in Northwest Arkansas, I just want to say welcome. We are really happy to have you here in our home, and we hope you enjoy yourself this week. And you'll see over the course of the week why Northwest Arkansas is a great place to live and a great place to do business. Now, first, I just want to apologize for not being able to be with you in person. Something's come up that I've had to, to leave town but I'm really pleased that Dave Gagina, our Senior Vice President of Supply Chain, Innovation, and Automation, will be speaking on behalf of Walmart. Now, Dave is just a proven leader who is committed to transforming the way we work, leading our business, and he's gonna take us into the future. Now, I'm gonna let him tell you more about that, but I know he is really excited about the work that his team is doing and hearing about more about what you are doing. I think you'll find that Northwest Arkansas is an exciting place. There is a lot going on here, a lot of growth, a lot of development, and I wanna wish you the very best as you get in this week. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. Thanks again for coming, and I hope to see you the next time you're here. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd, I'd like to thank Plug and Play for allowing me to speak uh, with this group today. As John noted, my name is Dave Gugina, and I lead innovation and automation within the U.S. operations uh, for Walmart. When John asked me to uh, speak for him at this event today, I jumped at the opportunity to get into a room with innovators and entrepreneurs. There is, there's something about interacting with startups, their energy, their focus on solving problems for customers, and that is something, a feeling that we try to ignite within my organization in Walmart on a regular basis. So I am ecstatic to be here with all of you today. John, John also mentioned uh, in his video, Northwest Arkansas, and that it's a great place 
to do business, as well as a great place for individuals and families to live. And I couldn't agree more with him. I wanted to take a moment for folks who are not as familiar with the area to talk a little bit about why we believe this is such a unique area of, of the United States. First off, there are some incredible organizations, uh, world leading, that call this home. Tyson, J.B. Hunt, the company I work for, Walmart. In addition to those organizations, we have a, a world-class university in the University of Arkansas. Uh, for those of you who don't know, they were recently rated number one. Their supply chain educational program was rated number one in the country. So we're excited to recruit. Um, but, but not only is this a place uh, that has incredible organizations and great, a great university, there is a budding ecosystem for startups. If you're looking for co-working space, literally a few hundreds, a hundred yards away from where we are today, they're standing up the ledger. There's also uh, places like Grit or The Exchange. If you're looking to interact with other startups, hop on Google. Almost every weekend there are events for entrepreneurs and startups to get together in the area, learn from one another, learn from those in industry, and help grow their business. If you're looking for an accelerator, uh, you can meet with great individuals like, like Plug and Play. If you're looking for funding, there's private equity funding available in the area. There's loans available in the area. But it's also a great place to live. Uh, shortly after the Plug and Play event, my wife and I moved our two girls to this area, and we have moved quite a bit. I've been in supply chain my entire career, and those of you who have been in supply chain know how it is to, to move around. And I can honestly say that this is our favorite location that we have lived in to date. There's something about the fusion of art and music and food and outdoor activities that Northwest Arkansas has that is truly unique and special. Uh, those of us who live here will often say it's, it's the best kept secret in the United States. Although I would start arguing by my inability to get a reservation on Friday and Saturday night in downtown Bentonville or find a parking spot, the secret's getting out, so, so come, come soon. So, you know, the, the next thing I want to talk about is a company that has resided in this area for what will be this year six decades. And that's Walmart, the organization that I have the opportunity uh, to, to work for. And over those six decades, this company has been reshaped and has transformed in response to customers' needs and wants. And if you look at Walmart more recently, we have been undergoing a digital and technological transformation as a company. Those of us uh, in my organization will often say that technology is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. It is something that can transform society, can reshore, reshape organizations like Walmart, and can be used as a method for improvement for individuals. I'd like to share with you all a story about how we are reshaping work for our associates. I was traveling um, a few weeks back to one of our fulfillment centers in Pedrickstown, New Jersey. It's a next generation fulfillment center where we have deployed our state of the art software um, warehouse management system in, uh, in combination with the new automation system we're deploying in our uh, Gen 1 next generation facilities. And at the site I met uh, Judith, who goes by Judy, and she operates, she's a cell operator at one of our pick stations. And Judy was explaining to me how she had changed her process to improve the performance or the entitlement of a machine that we had just installed downstream that closes and tapes boxes shut. And after my conversation with Judy, I walked away thinking, had Judy been conducting that job uh, manually, had she been walking six to eight miles a day, picking hundreds of items into a pick cart, she may not have had the time nor the energy to utilize her creativity, to 
to utilize her problem-solving skills. To have empathy for a downstream operator and a machine to help them perform better. And that is what, that's the power of the technology that we're deploying throughout our supply chain. It allows humans to do what we do best, best in concert with machines who excel at processing large quantities of data quickly, or completing repetitive tasks at high speed with high levels of precision. So not only are we rolling out these types of technology that will be game changing for our supply chain and transformational for our associates, uh, we're also rolling new technology out for our customers so that they can more easily interact with Walmart. What you see on screen here is our uh, uh, scan and go process. But I think our CEO, John Ferner, said it best uh, when he said, we must disrupt or be disrupted. And I know within my organization, we take that to heart. We are being disruptive with new technology that we are rolling out throughout our supply chain to transform it. This is a very high level rendering of, of our, our supply chain. Um, but I wanna speak a moment on how the innovation, the automation team work. And, and if, if you're on the innovation automation team, why don't you just raise your hand? I think we've got a, a decent sized group. So these are product managers and engineers that want to meet you all, uh, learn more about the problems that you're solving today. So our team, we, we look at the current supply chain and we break it down to its elemental inputs and outputs. And then we reimagine what the supply chain can look like understanding the capabilities of modern day software and hardware. And then we work to deploy that technology over time. And these aren't things that are happening years from now. I'll show you videos of technology the team has deployed in the last few years um, uh, here, here in a moment. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll hop to that now. So uh, this is an incredible application that's helping us make better decisions that I wanted to speak on briefly today. So our strategy team, led by Mohan Akala, uh, in partnership with our technology, our labs organization, and our product teams, have built a tool called Mobius. And Mobius is essentially a digital clone of our supply chain. It allows us to simulate current volume moving through our network, but also an endless number of permutations of future networks and future volume levels that we would want to look at. Some of the outcomes that we get from utilizing this application are understanding what capabilities should we be deploying in our network. How will those capabilities impact our cost to serve from a supply chain standpoint? Uh, this will also help us better deploy capital and know where we need to retrofit assets or where we need to deploy greenfield assets within our supply chain. Uh, an example of a problem that we looked at was our, in last mile delivery. Uh, we, we, the team studied uh, the US, they broke down the US into what we call micro pixels which are just small geographic regions of the US. And we looked at uh, a radial catchment for nine, a nine mile catchment, a 12 mile radial catchment, and then a spatially optimized catchment. And we found that the spatially optimized catchment was much more efficient from a service standpoint and a cost standpoint than our typical radial catchment. So these are the types of problems that we can utilize technology like this so that we can make more intelligent decisions as a supply chain operation. But not only are we investing in new applications, we're investing in material handling equipment that's transforming the way that we work. So I'll play this video and, and speak to it. What you'll see at the beginning is what we like to call bolt-on technology. You're seeing now, this is case, a case manipulation bot uh, that we have deployed. And what this is helping us do is uh, ease the job of loading cases onto conveyors. Rather than doing that physically, you get to be a cell operator and operate these bots. Next, you see our six-side Cognex scanners as well as our auto-label applicators. This technology improves the accuracy with, with respects to what we're sending downstream as well as making us more efficient. The next video is more transformational technology we're deploying. This is our symbiotic system. This technology uh, has cases and pallets arriving at a DC. 
Those cases and pallets get ingested by the system. Uh, a bot uh, de-layers the cases and then dual robotic arms singulate the cases. We then send those cases through a six-sided scanner that you see there that inspects the case to ensure that, can be an ingest that it can be ingested by the automated storage or retrieval system. From that point, a high-speed lift brings the case to the appropriate level and an autonomous mobile robot takes the case and puts it away in a dense modular storage structure. Very uh, similar or analogous to how data would be stored in a computer hard drive. Once there's demand on a case, it is retrieved by the autonomous mobile robot and brought to an outbound palletization cell, what you see now, where dual robotic arms grab, orient, and place cases to form a dense, intelligently layered pallet meaning it's layered by aisle, it's layered by department, it's layered by feature for ease of unload at downstream assets. The next technology you're seeing is technology we're deploying in our perishable distribution centers. We've partnered with a company named Vitron. And this technology is not all that dissimilar to what you saw with the symbiotic technology. We ingest pallets and cases, we're able to automatically depalletize and automatically palletize to form intelligently layered pallets. The key differences though between this technology and the one you saw before are this technology operates in a fully cold chain compliant environment, meaning it can operate in temp temperatures of negative 20 degrees all the way to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, as well as in humidity levels that can exceed 90%. The other key difference is the fact that the majority of the cube in this system uh, is stored in pallet form. And that is because the goods need to leave in FIFO order. They arrive uh, together in pallet form typically. And the most cost efficient way for us to store goods in FIFO order is to keep them, keep them on their original pallet and then move them out. This system is reshaping the way that our associates work. It's improving the productivity and the responsiveness of our supply chain. And it's, it's creating a better experience for our customers. It'll improve our in-stocks. It'll improve the freshness because of the speed that our supply chain can respond to customer demand. All right, I wanna change gears for a moment. Let me get my slide up, there we go. So when I, hold on one sec. There we go, okay. When I think about our business today, we have an incredible amount of momentum. And I truly believe that Mr. Sam would be proud of where Walmart is today and how we are reshaping uh, the, the, the business to better serve customers, to allow them to save time, save money, and live better lives. Mr. Sam was the ultimate entrepreneur. Uh, arguably one of the, the, the best uh, ever. And that entrepreneurial spirit of focusing on the customer, solving problems for them, uh, having an obsession over the front line and solving problems for your associates, those are things that are in our DNA and they will be for a long, long time. But one thing I know to be true is today we operate in a larger, more complex environment in the retail space than ever before. The problems that we are confronted with are some of the most complex problems to solve in industry, and we cannot do that alone. We need startups like yourselves. We need entrepreneurs and innovators like yourselves. <clears throat> when I think about the benefits of partnering with folks like the individuals in this room, I think about speed. There are many things that we are very good at in Walmart. There are areas of expertise that our partners, you all, can bring that we're not necessarily experts at, and that can help us move faster when solving problems. I think about innovation. As I noted, we have to solve some of the most complex problems in retail. We can't 
solve those problems just internally. We're looking for the best minds across the globe to help us attack these problems and solve them again to drive a better experience for our customers and the associates that we service internally. So I want to give an example of us, uh, of a partnership that we had, and I won't go into too much detail because these gentlemen are going to speak with you here in a few minutes. But Walmart, as many of you know, operates one of the largest private fleets in the country. We have 12,000 uh, drivers in our fleet uh, today. And these drivers are some of the, the best compensated in industry, you may have noticed. Many of my family members did because they were calling me a couple weeks ago when we announced you can make $110,000 uh, in your first year driving for Walmart. I had a lot of people that were suddenly interested in being uh, drivers for Walmart, which is great. But not only do we want to compensate our employees incredibly well, we want to equip them with world-class tools so that they can do their job to the best of their, their capabilities. So, Jake, I think it was in this room uh, probably two years ago at the last event that you and I met. And Jake comes up to me and he says, hey, Dave, do you want to go check out my rig out front? And uh, he literally had his, his Class A vehicle sitting outside uh, the record here. We hopped in the cab. He showed me platform, the platform science technology. And from there, uh, we built a partnership with our product team, our tech teams, and we have deployed their technology to all 12,000 uh, drivers in our fleet. What you see on screen is an application that our tech team developed. I think I saw Parvez in the crowd. Maybe you can raise his hand. Uh, Parvez's technology team in partnership with Scott Donahue's product team developed a tool uh, named in transit, which essentially helps our driver, our drivers uh, understand, communicate better uh, internally. It helps with navigation. It helps with scheduling. Uh, so I'm not going to go too deep into this because uh, here shortly, both Scott and Jake uh, are going to have a panel discussion where they talk about uh, this, that particular experience. So with that, uh, I, I, I want to close out. Uh, but before I do, I just want to share one more thought. We are solving some incredibly large problems at Walmart. And as I noted earlier, we can't solve them alone. So I know myself and my team members uh, from Walmart that are here today, we are so excited to meet all of you to hear about the problems that you're solving within this industry, and we look forward to partnering with you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak with you today. Thank you, David. We appreciate you being here to speak on our behalf, and thank you for your partnership with Walmart. I, I want to shout out uh, Kevin Kowalski, also a part of your team. Uh, I think for those in the CPG side, the supplier side, having 50 plus Walmart people in attendance at a meeting shows their commitment to this and uh, innovating within the supply chain. So thank you again, Walmart. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm now honored to spend a few more minutes going in depth with both Scott and Jake. I'm going to ask them both to come up, and I have the wonderful honor to uh, moderate this great panel. Scott and Jake, come on up. Thank you again, David, for, for introduction to this right now. For those in the crowd that still don't understand the model and how this all works, this is really going to crystallize the value that the plug and play process brings to the table with both the startups like Jake and then with the corporate partners like Walmart. So I'm going to put on my glasses because I'm old and I can't read very well. Um, so Scott is the VP of Innovation and Automation at Walmart. Scott leads the end-to-end e -end data, quality, and transportation and automation product teams. That's a very large business card. And then Jake Field, CTO and co-founder of Platform Science. Jake is a serial technology entrepreneur that has founded or launched eight companies. So first of all, a big round of applause for these guys. All right, gentlemen, we're here today to learn more about your success story as a startup and enterprise working together. Every relationship begins with that initial introduction. I know David spoke a bit, but give us a little bit more about that story. Yeah, sure. Appreciate you having me. Um, yeah, so uh, Dave told part of the story. Um, the part of it that I remember most keenly as well is uh, I came down for this event uh, two years ago, whatever it was before uh, the COVID of it all. And uh, 
was over at the museum and we were presenting. I had been a uh, startup alumni at that time. I said, come on and go ahead and pitch, put your stuff in front of everybody. So I came down. It's always a little bit stressful for all these other startups doing your pitch. So I got up there, um, laid down what we had going on, probably five or seven minute pitch. And afterwards, uh, kind of looked around the room, wandered to the back, waited around, and said, like, okay, I, I guess I did a good job. Um, <laughs> Hopped in my Uber. I was like, okay, time to hit the airport. I'm out of here. Um, about you know, three or four minutes in my Uber when I get a phone call and somebody from Plug and Play said, hey, where are you? I'm like, well, I'm going to the airport. Like, uh, Walmart wants to talk to you. You got to get back here. And I was like, oh, oh shit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and Joe Metzger was uh, at the facility. He had seen the talk and he said, uh, you know, I saw your presentation. Uh, does it really do what you said it does? And I was like, yeah. Uh, it, it does. And he said, well, that's, that's what we're looking for. And then he kind of gave me the look of like, does it really do what you said it does? Because otherwise I'm going to kill you later. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he said, sure enough, it does. You know, we rolled out with Schneider, some other large fleets. And he said he'd, he'd been looking for something like this. He'd been doing some ride-alongs with the drivers, getting firsthand um, kind of visibility as to what their days looked like. And he was looking for something to help improve what do their day-to-day -day operations look like? How do they deploy software within Walmart alongside the telematics infrastructure and the necessary plumbing to make all this work and even third-party applications? So uh, it, it was a pretty exciting uh, thing to happen. Uh, you know, it's those little things, you never know where they're gonna go. And uh, it was kind of the start of a, a long-standing relationship. So that was pretty exciting. And I blanked on the fact that, you know, the night before I brought a truck here and <laughs> brought it in front and David checked it out and all that stuff. But nonetheless, uh, appreciate everything from plug and play because it's been a great journey. And Scott, you specifically sought these guys out because they had a platform that you were looking for. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, certainly. First of all, thanks, Josh, for facilitating. Say thanks for putting this on. And then Dave mentioned earlier, Parvez, thank you for building this application. And then Chad and your team, I appreciate you deploying it. Um, it's just been a fantastic partnership with you, Jake. So appreciate it. So we had a problem that we had to solve. We needed to, as Dave mentioned earlier, provide our drivers a world-class experience, which in current state, we were not. Um, we also needed real-time visibility into where our assets were within, uh, you know, on the road with our fleet. Uh, and then we needed to provide our stores a real-time ETA when our trailers were going to arrive, when that freight was going to come in. So that was a major problem. And as you can imagine, like being the largest supply chain in the world, that is no small problem to solve. So, um, you know, we, we had ideas in mind on what that solution would look like. And, and in fact, Parvez's team had actually built some, uh, a, a driver workflow application. But what we didn't have was, as Jake mentioned, the telematics infrastructure, the plumbing, so to speak, to be able to deploy this application. So. Um, you know, platform science, I would say we sought them out because they solved one of our business problems, right? Oftentimes I see, you know, different solutions that are out there where someone attempts to come up with an idea and then make it fit to a problem, but Jake and team did the opposite. They figured out what our problem was and then came up with a solution and then provided it to us. So that solution was a, was a telematics infrastructure. So what specifically about Jake and team was so interesting to you guys? I liked the I liked the idea that we were able to deploy our application direct on their infrastructure um, right out of the gate. But in addition to that, because they were a small, so sort of scrappy, nimble startup, they allowed us to build together. Right. One of the things that we found is when we partner with large companies, uh, large other providers, the ability to customize to our own, you know, our own needs is actually fairly low. Um, and, and, and when we do get that customization, it often takes a long time to get there. Uh, one of the benefits of working with a smaller company, uh, Platform Science in particular, was that, you know, one, I had direct access to Jake. So, you know, hey, Jake, we need this functionality. Can you build it for me? Yes, of course we can. Great. When can I have it? Two weeks from now. Fantastic. Um, is the ability to quickly pivot, right? Which, you know, Dave mentioned earlier, unless we start disrupting, we will be disrupted. So we have to move with a sense of urgency. Um, and, and working with Platform Science has, has allowed us to do that. So where would you both say we are today with this? Um, so, I mean, I guess you can speak to where the, the solution is now from the fleet side of things, right? Yeah, for sure. So we're rolled out to over 12,000 private fleet drivers. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of, and I mentioned world-class driver experience earlier, is we went from a net promoter score of 20 to 85. 
85 is best in class, right? And we were able to do that by rolling out to over 7,000 tractors. At the time, it was roughly 9,000 drivers. We've hired some since, obviously. Um, and we did it in like 15 weeks, which was a super, super intense rollout. Like, as you can imagine, anything that we do at Walmart, when we want it to go network, you've got to be able to do it at scale. So, uh, so we're rolled out to our entire private fleet, um, which Dave mentioned is, is more than 12,000 people now. Um, and where we're taking it now, next steps is the application was so successful for our own private fleet, we're going to expand it to every load that gets moved for Walmart. So if you pull a load for Walmart, our intention is this application will be on there, um, which is more than 50,000 a day. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, on, on our side of things, it's, uh, it's, it was exciting to see that whole growth on the Walmart end, get their application out there. Um, and even uh, deploy it alongside of other third-party solutions. So um, what we've tried to do is pull together an ecosystem of best-in-class providers. So they're able to deploy out their solution along with things like ELD, um, things that are way station bypass, and other best-in-class solutions across the space rapidly with all, all within that window of time. Um, so that's been pretty exciting. Um, you know, what we've really tried to do on our side of things is fulfill our mission to deploy software and technologies to vehicles, make it simple, make it easy. Um, so alongside doing Walmart, you know, we were working through a lot of our other major fleets. So as you take a look at Schneider, Werner, um, uh, U.S. Express, CR England, you know, just to name a few, um, it's a challenging business to operate at scale. Uh, Walmart definitely pushes the envelope, but uh, it was exciting to see, you know, such a great success story. Yeah, for sure. A couple more things that I would add that this enabled, you know, Dave talked about the customer earlier. The reason that we wanted to give a world-class driver experience to our drivers, one, that's the right thing to do, but two, it helps us serve our customers better. So when we got that real-time visibility, we were able to tell our stores when these loads were going to arrive. We went from roughly a 60% accuracy rate to north of 90%. Well, what happens when you get a 90% accuracy delivery to the stores is the stores can start predictably planning labor to be able to unload that freight. Well, the faster that freight gets unloaded, the faster it gets onto our store shelves. The faster it gets onto our store shelves, the better experience we can provide to our customers. So, so even though this seems like it's a back-end application that would be super far removed from the customers, it actually wasn't. It was a customer-facing application, and we solved a pretty major problem. So you guys have been together for about a year. What are the strengths of a relationship of this type with Walmart and a startup? Yeah, I'd say from my side of things, um, you know, driving the industry roadmap, right? So between what Walmart's doing, the carriers that are collaborating with them, and just what they're leading through things like sustainability and just overall taking a look at, you know, as you said, supply chain, not supply link. It's not just transportation. It has to go to the physical facilities. How do all these different things work together? Introduces enormous uh, challenges or opportunities. I think COVID pushed everybody. Um, you'd start to take a look at uh, how do you have, you know, paperless contact? You know, how do you remove these processes that have existed forever and modernize those into a digital landscape? So that's pretty exciting there. And then just that network effect permutates into all the different partners within our kind of catalog of solutions because they're forced to raise the bar and create better and better solutions for Walmart and other fleets that really want to innovate on top of what they're doing today. So just as we expect now from modern devices, when you purchase a product, when you install a platform or a solution, it should get better over time. That shouldn't be the start, the end of the best that, you, that you're going to get. So. so in a relationship like this, there also may occasionally be a speed bump. What has been the most difficult in a relationship with someone the size of Walmart with a new startup? You can go ahead. <laughs> You were both so quick to want to answer that one. <laughs> well, I would say, you know. It's all positive. <laughs> Walmart's huge, right? So, um, you know, as we got started, um, it was great that we got to meet everybody and go through the pleasantries. And then Walmart said, okay, well, we'd like to do a pilot. Sure, no problem. So uh, they said, we want to do 65 vehicles or something like that. Sure, no problem. At 65 locations simultaneously. So we had to literally airdrop people in throughout the country to install devices, do deployments, do driver training, all within the span of a, a week or two to make sure we could prove what we could do. And, you know, it seemed pretty crazy at the time, um, exciting at the same time. But, you know, it was really a, a test not just of our technology, but of our operations. Because then we followed it on with the rollout and had to go and get all the <laughs> vehicles across the entire country within a three-month span. 
So, you know, it was a thorough process. It was exciting to do. Um, you know, it made me excited about some of the other things that we're doing now of having uh, native telematics coming from the OEMs like Daimler and Navistar coming soon. So we do not have to actually airdrop into all those locations. We can remotely turn that on. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's challenges, it's strengths, it's opportunities of a large partnership. Scott? Yeah, building on the speed theme, I think, one, just to talk about the deployment, it was, it was a challenge, right? Anytime you deploy anything at the scale of, at which you do it with Walmart, it, it takes a very, very large concerted effort, um, especially when you don't want a portion of your fleet operating on one service provider and a portion of your fleet operating on the other, right? Um, so, so we had to do it quickly. And I think it pushed both of our organizations to be able to, to, to do that. I know, I know Chad and Kurt's product team and the tech team were spread super thin as well. So I would say, you know, roll out at scale. Um, but in addition to that, I would say on, on the speed theme, the platform science team moved fast. They challenged us. They pushed us to move faster than we were probably comfortable moving, which was fantastic. Right? Like, that's what we need. They came to, J Jake mentioned, you know, EBOL or electronic bill of lading earlier. That was something that, yeah, it was on our, ra our radar, but it wasn't something that we were actively pushing for because we had enough on our plate, right? Like, we were focused on, on the deployment and the rollout of, of this telematics infrastructure. So, you know, I would say for, for us, it's to move faster, to be able to keep up with some of the innovative and creative ideas that you know, some of these startups bring to the table, which quite frankly is, is good, you know, disrupt or be disrupted. So final two questions for the panel and then we'll open it up to the audience for any questions. Jake, there's a lot of future Jake sitting out here in the audience with startups today. What advice can you provide to them so they can be sitting up here as successful as you with somebody like a Walmart? Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the day. Uh, startup life is uh, intense to say the least, but you know, uh, you always got to do that one more thing, right? So just making it here to Arkansas for that event, you know, was pushing it. I was in Alabama the day before, and that's why I actually was able to bring the truck up with me because I was at some other event. But it was easy to say, hey, I don't have time. I can't do it. But I just did that one last little thing. I showed up to that one last little event. And I think many of you probably have similar stories. And just that one more little thing often makes a, a huge amount of difference. So uh, just stay at it. Scott, for the other large companies in the room that may not be yet as far along as you guys are with something like this with a startup, any advice you could provide to them? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll give a piece of advice on the first question as well. At least from our perspective, one of the things that, that the platform science team did very well is they solved a problem we had. They didn't bring us a pre-canned solution and tried to fit it into our problem. They solved a problem that we had, right? And the difference in what I just said made all the difference in this rollout. Um, and then advice for other, other large enterprises, be open to working with smaller companies. There's benefits, right? Innovation, speed, being able to very, very quickly pivot, I think are all, are all things that we, we benefited from, quite frankly. And I, I mentioned it earlier, they challenged us to get better, right? Not only because they were able to move with speed, but they were also working with some other providers that had some other ideas that hey, you know, best in class in the industry, why, why don't we adopt that? So, so I would say, again, just for the large enterprises, don't be afraid to work with a small company, um, especially if they've got a sort of a proven, trusted management team, um, because good things could happen. Thank you both for being on this panel and sharing your story. I'm going to turn it over to the crowd here for any questions that you may have for Jake uh, and or Scott. Jake did such a good job, there's no questions. I think the other th suggestion Scott was gonna have for uh, enterprises out there was if you haven't talked to Platform Science, make sure you talk to Platform <laughs> Science about your fleet. <laughs> what he said. We got a question. The long walk, Harry. Hey guys, I'm Keon with yeah, we heard you. Keon with Plug and Play. Um, you guys shouted out a couple of people from the different teams, different verticals that all sort of collaborated to make this work. How common is it, how rare is that as an organization to see that collaboration between the different teams to roll something like this out? That's a great question. I would say it's less common than it should be. 
Um, this was a fantastic example of a close partnership. So when we were rolling this out, at one point in time, I can distinctly remember we had one of our software development engineers, one of our product managers, literally a fleet driver, somebody from platform science, and somebody from regional operations, all sitting in the back of a DC, which is where we dispatch our trucks from, talking about functionality and how things are working together. So we physically went to the location of where that work takes place, which sounds like a novel idea, right? But you know, it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't happen as often as, as you would like. And I think just that direct input like I said, from a driver who had been driving for 30 years, providing real-time feedback with the software development engineer that was changing the code on the fly, um, with platform science and our product managers all in one location, that close collaboration, I think was one of the reasons why we were so successful, right? Because we could have tried to roll it out and the first DC that we went to could have failed. And then instead of taking 15 weeks, it could have taken 50, right? Yeah, I mean, I think you guys did it right. And, and we're seeing it from more and more orgs, which is exciting. Often, telematics was a telematics manager or VP in the organization, that's it. But we're now seeing participation from legal, from driver management, from sustainability, from um, HR across the board, because there's applications and solutions getting deployed down the trucks for the drivers from all those different groups. It isn't just about dots on a map these days. It's about true operational efficiency. Good question. Any other questions? Awesome. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank Appreciate you, everybody. It. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. Frederick, turn it over back to you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Scott. That was really great, I thought. A very insightful discussion and awesome example of corporations and startups working with one another. Now um, it's time for some startup pitches. We're going to have six in total today. This is the first group of three. And let's give it up for the startups that came uh, from all across the country to be here today. So please, round of applause. <laughs> Show some energy. I love it. And Eric Rodriguez, you're up first uh, from Vendorflow. Stage is yours. Thanks so much, Frederick. Uh, let's see. Are we on? You can hear me. OK, good. Uh, great to be here. Hi there. I'm Eric Rodriguez with, uh, with Vendorflow. Um, and oh, right. So I'm in charge of the slides. There we go. OK, good. So OK. So yeah, today we'll be talking about logistics communications, uh, specifically trucking communications uh, today. So over the last, pardon me, uh, getting the uh, clicker going. Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. My, my bad. Um, it's totally, totally separate experience uh, between these, uh, these screens here. OK, there we go. OK, good. That, that, that was an intention getter. That was intentional. So you'll see. Good, good, good. OK, good. So here we are. There's been several, uh, over several years, there's been a great deal of investment in supply chain technology, trucking technology in particular, a great proliferation of new uh, transportation management systems, warehouse management systems, visibility systems, and beyond. And part of the side effect or outcome of that is we have our truck driver here uh, with dozens of new trucker apps. Uh, and the idea behind these dedicated trucker apps is that the shipper, forwarder, broker uh, wants to coordinate with this truck driver and says, truck driver, please install this app. If you install this app, you can submit structured data back to me. You can book loads. You can share your GPS. You can say you arrived, you departed. Document exchange can all transpire over these great, convenient apps for you, truck driver. Uh, but there's one issue here, which is... There we go. Uh, the truckers aren't, aren't using these apps, uh, not reliably at all. About 75% of the time, the truck driver says, look, I already have 10 of these apps on my phone, not installing another to create another login and password to do very simple interactions to tell you that I arrived. I need to install a whole app uh, for such simple interactions. And there's about 100 reasons why uh, they're not using it. And it's because there's about 100 plus of these trucker apps. There's too many. It's too much friction to expect of truck drivers. And so what are they doing? Uh, when they're not um, using these apps well, uh, spoiler, uh, they do what they like to do. Uh, they uh, will use their email, SMS, call, and these social messaging apps like WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook Messenger, even Instagram sometimes, to inform the broker to say, I'm on my way, or here's my GPS, or here's my document. It's happening on all these channels. This is just reality of the way that trucking is done today. 
very ad hoc, very informal across these different channels. And you can see how popular WhatsApp has been getting. Uh, 75 million in this country uh, monthly active users of WhatsApp. If you add up uh, Facebook Messenger and the rest, you have a lot, a lot of truckers. And so uh, the other issue here uh, with this topic is that if you're the broker, shipper, forwarder who's trying to uh, capture all this data from truckers, um, you're going to have a hard time making sense of all these communications happening between your operations team and these owner, operator, partner, carrier, truckers. Uh, good luck auditing the communications. Good luck. Um, having reporting uh, or insights or running processes or automations based on a bunch of communications that are happening in black boxes. It's not just one black box, it's nine black boxes of separate channels that your employees are using to communicate with drivers. And so uh, the solution we come up with here at VendorFlow is to say, why not uh, acknowledge reality, just reach the drivers by the channels they're already using, uh, reach them where they are in such a way that we can capture that data we need from them, that visibility data, the GPS data, the document documents, the arrived, depart, and any other event that you care about, we can just capture it from the channels they're already using. Why fight people when you can reach them where they are, is the philosophy here. And let me just show you a quick uh, example here in our demo. So one more click should get the video going, yep. And you'll see on the left is the interface for, let's say, a dispatcher or maybe a warehouse receiver who needs to communicate with drivers. In this example, they're going to push a load offer to a driver. Say, we got a load. Are you available to take this load? And in this example, the driver prefers WhatsApp. We vendor flow. We know the preference of the driver. We'll route it to their preferred channel so they're most responsive. And you see it's more than just texting back and forth. Uh, you can send these little microforms so they can uh, transmit structured data. I accept. I reject. I'm arriving. I'm coming soon. These are formal concepts that we can grab and push back to your core system, your TMS, your visibility system, your ERP, whatever you care about. So it's a way of bridging that gap, reaching them where they are, capturing this data. You'll see a, a GPS example. So yeah, we want to see, uh, are they actually near pickup? Um, OK, great. So they just shared it. By way of an app they already use, already know how to use, and this example happens to be WhatsApp. And we're capturing GPS, so that can flow straight to your systems. And lastly, you know, document exchange, of course, is a major facet of trucking. Basically, we've reached a place where these popular apps, like WhatsApp and Telegram and the others, are so mature that they are a dramatically better experience than any bespoke trucking app can be, and that's why they're using it. You'll see an audio recording uh, example as well to let them uh, communicate in a more natural way. So let me just recap some of the benefits uh, to why a broker, shipper, forwarder, warehouse operator might use vendor flow to reach the third-party drivers they're interacting with. And really, big one is to be more carrier friendly. A lot of folks will do with the thank a trucker day, uh, but this is a way to really thank a trucker, to say, rather than uh, nagging you all the time to say, hey, you got to install this special app, no, no, you work how you want to work, and we'll reach you there, and it'll be much easier for everyone anyway. And another big benefit here is being able to control your own data. Why have all this communication happen on these uh, dark channels, offline channels, uh, when you could have one singular centralized way to maintain all the communications you're having with external parties? That's your data, and it, you should act like it. And in terms of limiting liability, that's a big aspect of trucking as well. Um, misclassification cases and other disputes, um, you'll have clear visibility into what happened in each of these cases. You could always roll the tape very easily. And you'll be able to boost efficiency. So there's dozens and dozens of cases uh, that you might need where you're like, man, it's hard for my team to uh, get the, the heads up from the driver that they're on the way to the warehouse so we can organize the pallets. Well, with vendor flow, you can just hit them where they are, and you can get that information much more proactive way, much more structured way that integrates with your systems. So that's the, that's the pitch. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, to keep the momentum going, let's invite Coffee Labs up on stage, Ian White. The much. stage is yours. Thank you very much. I was just thinking back to the great presentations by Walmart and, and Platform Sciences earlier. And if we had a, um, a battle of boredom about 10 years ago in industry, uh, I'd say insurance and supply chain would be kind of neck and neck. But now, clearly, 10 years on, insurance is back of the pack. But I'm here to change that. Uh, so Coffee is a digital insurer. We focus on the SMB segment, which is the one to 200 power unit segment <clears throat> fleet of four higher fleets in the US that represents around 99% um, of motor carriers out there on 50 or 60% of trucks on the road. This is very much a business of, of mom and pops uh, across the country. Now, the reason uh, we're, we're involved in this is that insurance, unlike a lot of industries in the last 10 years, a lot of those um, 
that plug and play is helping to push along, remains very much in the, in the dark ages. So it's an incredibly antiquated process, broadly speaking, from the insurance point of view. Now, a couple different ways to identify that. First, um, the insurance industry in trucking has been bleeding cash. So there's a measure of profitability called the combined ratio. It's around 115 and going, uh, going higher, even fast. So it's running real hot. Every dollar in premium is returning about, um, well, every dollar in premium is paying out a dollar and 15 cents in claims and expenses. So you don't make money that way. The other thing is that the rates for um, motor carriers keep going up, an increase of around 10% per year for each of the past 10 years. So if you look at those things together, strategically, you figure industry is raising rates, but they're still losing money. What's going on? There's a reason trucking is called the Satan's pit of insurance. Uh, finally, the process for getting this done through brokers, because it's exclusively an agency-controlled domain, where the strong relationship between the insured, the motor carrier, and the agency, and it's a very weak relationship between the insurer and the insured, um, Brokers oftentimes can take 60 to 90 days to put together a quote because when I say insurance, you say file cabinets or beige carpets or EDI or, or things that are relatively antiquated relative to technologies that are available today. So what coffee does is a couple, a couple things that are unique. Um, three to be specific. First, we can quote instantly. The way we do this is we don't accept faxes. We have a digital application process by working with our broker partners. In just an application in seven minutes, quote, the same day versus literally you know, one to two months for what we see with incumbents. In terms of risk selection, so the reason I love insurance, many reasons, but one of my favorite, is that you first decide what is your risk appetite, yum. What do you want to price? And then how do you segment and price that risk? You don't say yes to every truck out there. You might say yo, ye no to green and yellow trucks, uh, the color, not the brand, just because they're not of your particular expertise, you might say yes to other colors on the spectrum. What we do as coffee is we've built a model that recognizes the 15 million commercial vehicles on the road and understand how to bucket them into one of 10 deciles. We know the best bucket of trucks are four times safer than the worst bucket of trucks. That allows us to define our risk appetite and then price accordingly. So when incumbents go to rate a fleet, what they'll often do is they'll look at a, a base rate, which is computed through state filings and algorithms you file with the state. And when I say algorithm at the, at the state level, I don't mean something modern day. I mean a relatively simple flow chart, which is actually 300 pages of Excels that are often printed uh, and made as a PDF if you want to actually review these things at state insurance regulators. But that's a digression. What we do is we then quote at the individual truck level, which gives visibility and transparency into the insured to help them understand how to maintain a lower total cost of ownership. Good trucks that are well maintained that might have advanced safety systems or have um, had uh, very kind of good history in terms of crashes and inspections will be oftentimes discounted significantly off of the base rate. So we price that way to give our fleets a much better sense of how they can kind of tie this together to keep their insurance costs under control, which is a desperate concern now given the rate uh, where we are now in the state of insurance and broadly speaking constraints around supply chain. Um, and we do this all very quickly. It allows us to recognize that technology makes an incredible difference. The key thing, addition, the, the third piece we do is we require telematics. So Jake was on stage talking about telematics. In coffee, as an insurer, we require telematics. That is a dual-facing camera. So yes, it is an inward-facing camera to the driver, and it's outward to the road. That does have some consternation with some segments of the population, the driving population. But in this segment that's facing 10% rate increases a year, insurance being the third biggest line item, the number one reason fleets are going out of business, you oftentimes don't have a choice. And if we can put up to 20% maybe of your premium back in your pocket for the sake of much better real-time loss control and underwriting and other things through a, uh, a, a, a driver-facing camera, that's absolutely worth it. And we've seen that um, many, many times. One other kind of concept I want to float out here is that the state of trucking for the SMB is only going to get harder over time. If you think about the very large truckload carriers, some of whom are, are here, um, they can take advantage of basically cost of capital. It's going to be lower for them as it certainly spikes for a lot of smaller fleets don't have this ability to access that. Also in terms of other resources like out fitting all your trucks with, with great telematic systems. What we do is we allow our fleets to basically level up and have the technology, have the platform that others simply cannot afford to have in this segment. We think about insurance as really being the tip of the spear in financial services. It's the third biggest line item, as I mentioned. But we look at the kind of the overall demographic 
of this segment. These are often folks that don't have access to credit, are paying retail for fuel, uh, ability for factoring and leasing and lending, they're getting squeezed. And because we are the insurer, we have this keen ability to understand how we can better underwrite and provide access to certain products and services that can help our fleets maintain viability. And it's especially important now, when we've seen a ton of new authorities created in the last 24 months alone. A lot of those folks are gonna face really hard times. Fortunately, many of them will be able to go back and lease on to larger company fleets again, but a lot of them are gonna be left holding the bag, that's really, really challenging. We're already looking at a 1% or 2% profit margin. So everything we can do to better level up financially, ensure our fleets will remain profitable, allows us to write good business. And that's what really we think about the future of trucking for everybody going forward. So thanks for your time. Pass it down. Thank you, Ian. Uh, to wrap up the first group of pitches, uh, let's welcome uh, James from Pracurate. Come on up. Hello, hello, is this working? Hi, uh, I'm one of the co-founders at Pacurate. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about the difference between being really good at putting things in boxes and being really, really, really good at putting things in boxes. Um, show of hands, how many of you have received a packet? oh, hands go up already, <laughs> a package that looks like that, right? There's a wave. <laughs> There's a wave of hands. Um, we all have. And uh, when you think about it, it's kind of embarrassing just to receive a package like this. Because even if you're not in supply chain professionally, you can kind of intuit um, that it was needlessly expensive to ship. Um, you know it was a waste of materials because you were on the hook to haul it out to the recycling bin. Um, and it took up precious space on a truck. Um, so there's a type of software that tries to prevent this from happening. It's called cartonization. It's a, a somewhat clunky word, um, but it's actually never been a more important function in fulfillment because it seeks to minimize cost and minimize environmental impact. And so today, I want to tell you about Pacurate, the most advanced cartonization system ever built. And when we set out to build it, we, we wanted to kind of draw a line in the sand. We knew it was a niche problem, but we wanted to establish a new standard for solving this problem. And so it was designed around three principles. One, it had to be a blazing fast API. So you could call it anywhere from your online shopping cart at checkout if you had to, um, or thousands of times per second in the warehouse when the order wave drops. Um, two, it had to be extremely customizable. So we support all kinds of common use cases, uh, you know, fragility, uh, stacking, nesting, rolling, poly bags, all these things. Um, but we can't anticipate every unique use case under the sun. Um, so shippers have to be able to open the hood and make it work for them. And three, and this is actually the most important principle, it had to optimize for cost reduction directly. That's never been done before, believe it or not. All prior generations of cartonization try to find the fewest and the smallest boxes that a shipment will go in, which makes sense. But it turns out fewest and smallest is not a perfect stand-in for lowest cost and lowest environmental impact. It sounds like it should be, but it's not. And it's actually a significant difference. We call this feature cost awareness. So every time you make a cartonization request to Pacurate, it's not just trying to find small boxes. It's looking at all of your costs, your material, labor costs in some cases, and it's looking at your transportation costs most critically. Whether you have your own fleet or you have really great negotiated rates with a carrier, uh, those rate tables have incentives built in that tell you when it makes sense to put your your shipment all in one big box or split it out into two or three. And by the way, that can change depending on what you're shipping, what carrier service you're using, where you're shipping to and from. And so what's the point? The point is the customers we have that have used this functionality have saved a minimum 6% on parcel spend. That's the difference between the old way of doing things and this new way of solving this niche but very important problem. Um, 
some of the customers on the screen up there have actually saved uh, more, upwards of 14 and 15 percent. And if you ask any of them, they'll tell you they actually see Pacurate um, as a competitive advantage. Uh, because it turns out once you get really precise at the packing level and do really deep optimization on this one spot in fulfillment, there's a ripple effect. You start actually creating efficiencies in adjacent touch points. As an example, our customers have a high degree of certainty what number of pallets, how many trucks they're going to use. But in addition to that, we've observed a 14% reduction in the number of floor-loaded trailers leaving from their DCs. It's kind of crazy. Um, just by tweaking at the box level, they're taking a significant number of trucks off the road. That's why, this, that's why the packing step matters. They also do modeling projects like, OK, we understand that you know, we, we can pick the right boxes now, but what boxes do I need? Well, they can actually use our engine to model that out. Over the next million shipments I do, what cartons should I keep in stock at each of my DCs? And by the way, those are going to change. Every time my costs change, every time my SKU mixes change. But that's an unprecedented level of efficiency and fulfillment. So that's about all my time. But um, if it wasn't clear, I, I care a lot about putting things in boxes. Um, and it, I, I truly believe it's a special step in fulfillment. Because how many other steps are your costs and your carbon footprint inextricably linked? So when you do deep optimization at this step, and you're measuring a saved dollar, you also have a high degree of confidence that you've reduced your scope three emissions a commensurate amount. And I think that's pretty special. It's like getting paid to be sustainable. And we can help you get there from day one with Pacurate. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, James. That concludes the first group of startup pitches. And I couldn't have asked for a better transition to the sustainability panel. Um, Danae Robert, please come on up. Sustainability and supply chain. Me now. Yes. Welcome, Zach, Steve, and Luke here with me. Thank you so much. Uh, before the break, let's talk about something that keeps us all awake at night: sustainability. <laughs> um, everyone, amazing. Thank you. My name is Danae. I'm a senior venture associate at Plug and Play, working in new materials packaging and sustainability. I'm very happy to be here with knowledgeable experts in the space in sustainability and supply chain. Maybe, Steve, if you want to start introducing yourself. OK, well, good afternoon. And uh, just another shout out to Saeed and Josh. Whether it's three days or three weeks, I don't know. But great putting the, the event together. Uh, Luke McCollum, and I lead our uh, Indian uh, sustainability efforts uh, within Walmart supply chain. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Sikra and I'm representing the Alliance Then Plastic Waste. I'm happy to say we've had a three-year relationship with Said and Plug and Play. And we're gonna make a connection today between a supply chain that's linear and a supply chain that's circular, helping to drive a circular economy. Thank you. And I'm Zach Fries. I work on the sustainability team at Walmart, and I work on the corporate sustainability, so everything related to climate, nature, waste, and circularity. So it's a pleasure to be here as well. Thank you so much. You have ambitious goals in sustainability um, that are quite difficult to reach. How, what are those, and how are you aiming to um, approaching them and reaching them? Yeah, so um, you know, you wake up every day, and uh, I get this feeling for me that uh, and Zach and I will will talk about this together. That uh, you know, you're one day closer. So one day closer to what? Well, our goal is in 2025, we're one day closer to, 20, to uh, zero waste. And then 2035, another day closer tomorrow to 100% uh, renewable energy. Massive undertaking. And then uh, the next day, another day closer to 2040, which is uh, zero emissions. So those really what drive our posture on our uh, broader sustainability goals. Thank you. And for the Alliance for Plastic Waste? 
uh, from the Alliance standpoint, first off, we're a nonprofit. So we're not in it to make profit, but we're in this to demonstrate that a profit can be made. And we think there's an 80 to $120 billion opportunity in value lost because plastic waste is not being put back into a circular economy. Along this pathway, we have goals to demonstrate solutions to de-risk and to work with communities across the value chain and to unlock capital. So the Alliance and our members are putting $1.5 billion as an investment in the form of grants, loans, and today I'll tell you about a prize to help de-risk and demonstrate these solutions. We have metrics of kilotons of waste recovered and recycled, the number of communities that we want to impact, but more importantly, the dollars that we need to unlock and catalyze to really make change in this space. So while 1.5 billion is a significant amount, it really pales the fact that we need 50, 75 billion in South, Southeast Asia alone. But as a global company, we're doing work across the globe, a big focus in, in Southeast Asia, but also in the Americas and in Europe as well. I encourage you to take a peek at our website. Today, I just want to make you aware of the Alliance, what we do, invite you to learn a little bit more, and maybe follow us. I'll be around for questions as well. But we do have some very lofty goals. And with a partnership and collaboration, we know we can achieve them. Thank you. Zach, is there anything? That's a huge goal, and I would say we also have goals around circularity. We play a big role in helping drive a circular economy at Walmart. And so in addition to what Luke said on climate, we also have goals on packaging, recyclability, so getting 100% recyclable packaging by 2025, using recycled content, and then eliminating 15% uh, of virgin plastic, so using more circular economy solutions for all of our packaging solutions by 2025. So some really big goals that are aligned with getting, out of, getting rid of plastic waste, which we think is a really significant problem, but moving to a better way to use materials that help move us to a more circular economy. That plays a role in climate, so to Luke's point, getting to zero emissions by 2040 is a very important goal um, as well, and so making sure circularity and climate work together to help make Walmart a more sustainable company. Thank you so much, and I'm glad you're talking about circularity because you are two organizations that work in different place in the value chain. Um, you know, maybe the Alliance for Plastic Waste mostly focus on, of course, waste, but also the materials in the packaging, the different layers, whereas uh, maybe to put it simply, um, Walmart is looking more at uh, traceability in the supply chain. How can your organizations work together? And maybe this will be just an example, but how can all the companies here work together and maybe be able to create circularity ar around packaging or around uh, what becomes waste uh, at the end of the day? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, take a stab at that. And, um, you know, one of the things that Dave showed up on the slide is really represents what we're here today about is together. This key word about uh, working together because any, any work that we do whether it's a technology partner, uh, whether it's a provider of a uh, consumable with our, in our merchandise organization, you th when you think in an end-to-end -end construct, it has to be together. We will not make, make uh, uh, those goals, if, if you will. And then along the way, you learn some things when it doesn't quite work out. Uh, we had a, a circularity endeavor the last couple of years, and we were taking a, a resin uh, out of car seats. So, you know, when, when a customer turns a car seat, we do not put it back on, on the shelf. And, but we learned how to extract that resin and turn it into circularity through uh, dog bowls and I think uh, child potty seats. And, uh, but there was, a, there was a second order effect on the, the uh, with what do you do with all the leftover parts? And then what do you do where it's stored? So we have to learn a lot. And then by partnering with different organizations, just chipping away, uh, you know, with, with enablers and partners that can help us think differently uh, to do that. Because the mass and scale of the portfolio of, of uh, product we have that can be candidates for circularity. And then if you can monetize it, uh, that's what uh, brings it to a point where it gets really exciting. If I can, let me build on that, Luke, because I think you make a great point about collaboration about across the supply chain. We call that collective intelligence and recognizing that 
within the alliance, we have members from the chemical and resin industry, from brand and retail, from converters and solid waste managers. And when that collective intelligence across that value chain comes together, that's where the breakthrough innovation really comes from. And whether it's brands like uh, Procter & Gamble or PepsiCo or leading retailers like Walmart that are driving this, bringing that value chain together towards a common goal, our, in our case, it's ending plastic waste in the environment, but doing so with the benefits in mind of a, a value chain proposition and better impact on the environment is, is why we do that. Our collective membership today is 68 members. We launched in January 2019 with just 27. We've grown to 68 members, some of the largest companies in the world. We look forward to more work with Walmart. We look forward to expansion with plug and play as well. So the connection today, taking the supply chain aspect more towards sustainability in the future is one reason that we're here to talk about this. And some specific examples, we talked about tracking and traceability being quite important. Some of the sponsorship that the Alliance has done with plug and play has identified some startup companies in that space, whether it's artificial intelligence for, for separation with a company, Gray Parrot, or circular using blockchain technology for traceability across the value chain, or other examples that I'm proud to say and humbled that the Alliance has helped fund 60 different startups and connected them with 13 of our member companies to help them grow. Very similar to the example that was shared earlier with Walmart. And I think that's why the, the necessity is there for companies to come together, identify the problem. Our problem, by the way, is waste in the environment with different solution sets. And that's what we're gonna help fund via grants, loans, and a prize. And I promise I'll tell you about that the next time. I feel bad for you, Steve. You're flanked by two Walmart guys. So we're gonna, you know, not attack you too much with Walmart information, but um, what's privileged to be here. Uh, well, we're, we're glad you are. And I would say, you know, it's just great to hear that collaboration mindset because you think about climate circularity, those are two huge challenges that our society faces, not just one company, it's everyone. And a company even the size of Walmart needs help. We need ideas, we need partners. And so as we think to the, the future of retail, we have to do it in a net zero economy and we have to do it in a circular way. And I have to say at Walmart, we've mastered the linear economy. We're great about buying and selling and putting on the shelf and letting the customer take it home or ship it to them in an efficient way. But what we have to improve is finding ways to use those materials again or to resell that product or to find new ways to do business with our customer that allows our business to still be healthy and profitable but serve the customers in a new way that doesn't deplete our resources. And so that's going to that's gonna require a lot of innovation, and we don't have all the answers today. So we're looking, and what I'm really excited, I've heard sustainability mentioned, I think I counted like nine times this morning already, and it's just great to see that being infused into this curriculum and this organization to hopefully bring us better solutions in, in supply chain. Thank you so much. There is definitely a, a focus in innovation and sustainability at the same time, and hopefully collaboration is part of it too. Um, carbon is one, of course, of the hottest topic in sustainability, uh, and of course, supply chain. Um, what are your goals around uh, carbon, and how are you looking to get to them in this short amount of time too? Yeah, I'll take that one. So carbon's the name of the game right now. Carbon, you've probably heard, it's a super big topic right now. Even the SEC is really interested in how organizations are managing carbon. Uh, our goals as a company are in our scope one to get to zero emissions. So absolute zero emissions by 2040. And so scope one and scope two, that's everything we own, our own assets, our, our own trucks, our own facilities. And then uh, scope two is the electricity that we procure. So thing, electricity that we use and so we're gonna to get to zero by 2040, and we're not exactly sure how we're gonna do that in every area, but we're working very, very hard on it. And then in scope three, so with our suppliers, we have a program called Project Gigaton, which is around uh, engaging with all of our suppliers on climate, and the target is one billion metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions between 2015 and 2030 to be eliminated, avoided, and we're about halfway there. So we've actually made some pretty significant progress. Just a couple weeks ago, we announced we're 574 million metric tons towards that target because of our suppliers, because of the companies we're working with that are setting goals, taking action, and then reporting progress year over year. So we have over 4,500 companies engaged, about 75% of our business, 
And our, our job is to really get every supplier we work with involved to help them on what they can do and then hopefully recognize them when they're able to achieve some, some great results. Yeah, so this is a massive undertaking. If you just think about size and scope of, of, of Walmart, and uh, you know, one of the slides again that Dave showed was, had a customer up there. So we have north of 200 million customer transactions a week where we have an opportunity to get an impression. And uh, the last pitch we saw is one of those impressions that we either have to give a good impression or a bad impression. And if we can apply technology with our partners with speed and drive an exciting result and eliminate things that contribute to the either scope one, scope two, and all three, that generates a lot of excitement, not only with the end product, but also uh, with our fantastic engineers and product and tech folks who are driving marvelous outcomes, whether it's in uh, our, our uh, private fleet, which is the scope one uh, uh, component of our portfolio, which by the way, for the Walmart portfolio, that's 75% of our emissions, roughly. And so if we don't think that that's a must do, I mean, we wake up every day thinking hard and we have some great engineering teams really looking at all angles of that and all the different uh, technologies. So uh, going after the, the causes of, of the carbon and how to reduce it in tandem, including working upstream is, is a key focus for us. And fortunately we have great partners working with. Maybe one build from my end. If we think of carbon, we use carbon in, in energy and manufacturing. It, it's used to produce materials. And on materials end, we know that when you use a recycled material versus a virgin, it's less carbon impact. So we're looking to help all of our member companies and others across the value chain reduce their carbon impact by recovering more plastic waste and putting it back into a circular economy. I promise I'll tell you about a prize. So just a couple hours ago, the Alliance announced a prize specific to flexible film. And we know there's value in flexible film, whether it's shrink wrap on a pallet, but single use is a particular challenge. And I know all of us benefit from using these types of materials, but we also cringe a little bit when we see that bag flying down the road, or perhaps it's not captured properly. So today on our website, we've just launched what we call the Alliance Prize. So it's a circular solution for flexible film packaging that will aid in proper recovery, recycling throughout the supply chain. We encourage you to look at this, to consider if you have a solution. The prize is $3 million. It's quite significant. It's our contribution to help identify a solution for this very specific packaging form that's a challenge for all of us. So if you look at circularsolutions.thealliancepriz.org, it'll tell you a little bit more about it. And we all know that startups come and solutions come when the problem's identified. So we've identified a problem. It's one of collection, it's one of sorting, and it's one of reusing these types of materials that are in all of our supply chains. So it's one step that we can do, and there is an automatic reduction in carbon with that. Thank you so much, and congratulations. I think that's great news. Um, and a lot of opportunities there, of course. You are facing a lot of corporations and startups. Um, any advice on how to work better together, um, how to um, innovate better in the space and sustainability? Hey, I like what Scott said earlier when he said, bring, it, bring a solution to our problem. And uh, you know, this, this is a massive uh, uh, challenge uh, for us. I think think big, uh, we think how we, how we attack the problem in many ways. We get really excited if we can think, if there's one change we could make. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do, but let's make sure we choose the most important things that have the biggest effect. We have an opportunity to eliminate north of 1,500 tons of plastic this year with a certain change. Uh, we gotta stay focused. Now that's a big change, and if we do it right, uh, we'll affect that, but uh, you know, from an advice perspective, just keep that big perspective and think end to end, not optimizing one and de-optimizing another part of the organization. Yeah, I would say, you know, um, I've been at this, I've been at Walmart for about 15 years now, and I've never seen this company be more uh, 
uh, innovative than it is right now. It's just great to see us moving. And so we're open, we're interested. We wanna hear from you. We wanna learn uh, what's out there and available because we wanna be better. We wanna be better for our customer. We wanna make it be a better company for the planet. Uh, and we need your help. So I would just say, don't be afraid to pitch us your ideas. And hopefully, we are a big company. may may take a little while to sort it around. But but the point is, we wanna we wanna hear from you. We wanna listen. So thank you. It, one thing I'd like to add is Zach and I have a prior relationship, and that is I used to work for the Procter and Gamble company and was leading their global package development. So I knew a little bit about this space. And Zach would always challenge us to do better, to use more recycled content, to design for recyclability. At the Alliance Stem Plastic Waste, all of that is coupled into what we strive for, and it's very simple, to help end plastic waste in the environment. That's our issue, that's our problem, and I agree with both Zach and Luke. Stay focused, persevere, bring solutions, and think out of the box. That's why we put forward something we call the Alliance Prize, because we can't think of it alone. And when we bring the collective intelligence of the entire supply chain together, that's when solutions come to bear particularly when you're connecting across, across these interstitial spaces. Material scientists think one way, but brand owners think another way. Supply chain engineers think another way. Putting everybody in the same room towards one problem is the way to have a breakthrough solution. So that's what we look for. We invite you to persevere, invite you to share your ideas with us. We have money to invest, whether it's Walmart or the Alliance, and we're looking for solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Or plug and play. <laughs> of course. Um, do you have any questions? I do want to open it to the floor here. Um, I know we're all looking um, forward to the break as well. All right. Everybody, how's everybody doing? Let's please get back into our seats. We have one great success story coming up right now between Georgia Pacific, one of our anchor partners here in the Northwest Arkansas program and one of our portfolio companies, uh, Gideon Brothers, an AGV startup out of uh, Zagreb, Croatia. So we have a five minute video coming up. Everybody can get back into their seats and then uh, we'll get on with the rest of the programming. Roll tape. I would call it new speed. Uh, new because it's something that we are creating that's not out on the market today speed in terms of developing something quicker, better, faster, so that we can develop it and then immediately deploy this out in the field. So Georgia Pacific is a consumer products company. We make and manufacture all sorts of products from building products to consumer products such as tissue, toilet, napkins. My role at GP, Georgia Pacific, is I'm an automation and robotics engineer. So I work under the innovation team and help provide different solutions from a transformative technology standpoint. My role in the organization is I'm responsible for the innovation team, which is part of the Automation Robotics Center of Excellence. My role is uh, I manage and responsible for the Automation and Robotics Center of Excellence in Atlanta. Innovation plays a big role for our group because it allows us to transform our current technology that we have uh, in our facilities and allows us to evolve and grow from a more higher efficiency standpoint as well as being able to tackle everyday obstacles and issues that we have. So Gideon uh, specialized in vision navigation systems with their current fleet of vehicles. Um, and so when we wanted to tackle trailer loading, unloading, we needed someone that um, had a camera system to be able to tie in to the vehicle to operate the vehicle and be able to move it around. As far as Infinity, they were a good design slash uh, manufacturing company when it comes to designing and building machines, um, since they build a bunch of our packaging equipment machines. So we kind of brought the two together and kind of said, hey, is it possible to work together to build a turnkey solution to build a vehicle and apply a navigation system on top? Basically in the industry right now, 45% of the labor in the consumer products business is loading and unloading trucks. And nobody had a solution that you could get off the shelf for that. So we decided to work with Gideon and Infinity to kind of move that along faster and really solve that solution for the future. We co-developed the solution, GP, Infinity, and uh, Gideon, 
where Infinity was responsible for the vehicle build with input from GP and Gideon, and Gideon was responsible for the brains and the navigation of the vehicle. A lot of our operation is from trailer loading and unloading out in our facilities and redistribution centers. So a big percent of it is just people constantly loading and unloading trailers. And for us to be able to automate that, we can scale across all of our uh, facilities as well as even across Coke from a manufacturing standpoint. Our team, our involvement was, is really to make sure that they had the information they needed. How do the forklifts go in, the variability inside of a trailer, uh, understanding that operational aspect and bringing it to the team who are machine builders and designers. It's the uniqueness of bringing two companies together, one being in Croatia, one being in the U.S. that basically do different things, one better than the other, and we brought them together to be successful at a solution with us facilitating the solution, right? So. Um, not one of them could have got there by themselves. So with the power of all three of us, we were able to come to a solution that looks like it'll be marketable in the future. The relationship between Infinity, Gideon, and us, we, we're still communicating on a weekly basis in terms of uh, the progress of the vehicle. As, as we sit today, uh, the vehicles have made strides in terms of the performance and utilization of the vehicle. Uh, I think we, we made a big step um, in the vehicle development. Uh, the next step in as part of this process is to really optimize the flow in and out of the trailers, being able to handle different types of loads, and then taking it to a facility to actually run the vehicle versus just here at the lab. The biggest success was being able to come up with a uh, definite product, uh, coming from a brainstorm idea to uh, designing it, to even just building it and, you know, fine-tuning and finalizing the product itself. The collaboration between Infinity, Gideon, and Georgia Pacific has really changed the way we think, that we, we can actually partner with somebody, be very honest, be very open as to the issues and concerns that, that come about, right? There's no, there's no hiding of, of um, issues and concerns. Everything's brought to the forefront because we wanna make sure we solve those problems instead of hiding those problems and then finding out later that, hey, this was an issue all the time. Building strong relationships with new technology partners like Gideon and Infinity for a unique project like this takes time. Our relationship with Plug and Play uh, and the forum with other strategics and other innovators uh, provides us early access to those companies and those technologies that we wouldn't normally get through regular channels. All right, yeah, round of applause to Grant and the team. Um, I thought that was great and I can't wait to see more of these uh, kinds of pilot projects and implementations coming out of hopefully also the session today. So um, that brings us to the second part of the supply chain startup pitches and a little bit of inspiration as to who could we uh, as corporations in the room today work with in the future. Now, we did a very good job with the first round, so I hope that we can maybe even do a little bit better for the second round this afternoon. So let's give a warm welcome to the startups that flew in to Bentonville. Come on, let's give them the energy. And Megan, you up? Hey, y'all. Um, I'm Megan Gray, and I'm the CEO of Mama AI. So before I start clicking away, I'll tell you a little bit about my story because it's how the technology was founded. I'm a former Googler and I was coming back on a business trip where suddenly I went into seizures. Doctors told me that I could not drive and I was like, what do doctors know? So being an AI engineer, I developed, uh, which is Mama AI. Well, I started a company by playing poker, as some people know in this audience, and that was the first ways. And then uh, one day I get a call from SoftBank um, Vision Fund. They saw my video on YouTube. And next thing I know, I have a 5,000 square foot labs in DC. I became the first woman ever to secure AI transportation lab in the United States. So, Mama AI, we use biometrics. We use 64 facial points to not only detect normal events like uh, distraction and drowsy, what you used to, but we also able to detect more complex events. And we able to take that across multi-solutions. So meeting multiple um, truck drivers and meeting with some of the um, fleet companies already in this audience, I know privacy is an issue. 
So one of the things that we do, we actually encrypt all of our data just like WhatsApp. So another position that I have, I actually consult the Department of Defense in all AI solutions. Um, this year, I became part of the Jake Award. My whole job is to support um, the Department of Defense and privacy and data processing. I previously did it with Lockheed Martin as well during the 2020 pandemic. I helped encrypt for their aerospace and for their, um, for their cargo as well. So you, uh, when you use Mama AI technology, we make sure that the data that we processing from the facial, the eyes, the head movement, for all the facial points, the privacy is there. You, use, you actually get the same um, technology that the government have because I'm the person that building and consulting them for it. So the market opportunity, uh, as I mentioned, we partner with George Washington University in DC, and uh, that's where we have our autonomous vehicles. So we have General Motors, Chrysler, um, Kia. And so what we're looking to do here uh, is uh, actually build a second office for fleet with University of Arkansas. And so uh, we already have tons of scientists and engineers, the academic backing. Again, the data privacy, um, pretty much we have top of the line. Um, there's, I know ev every single department agency, <laughs> I pretty much work with uh, everybody across the board when it comes to how to keep their privacy secret. And we actually uh, created a new platform that have not been released yet, but it will actually <laughs> be a, a great compromise between the trucking and the truck drivers. So Mom AI, as I mentioned, uh, we are a video startup, we are an Amazon Alexa startup, we have SoftBank, we have a couple of autos um, companies, and now we're looking forward to start a fleet division. Um, those are some of our partners. Uh, I'm the CEO, I'm also still the part of Architect. Uh, I cannot let the engineering part go. You have Dr. Mohamed Dahl, who uh, leads the week shows at GW. And so if you want to learn more about our solutions, um, just contact me and we can let you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just give it to Adrian. Thank you, Megan. Uh, to keep it going, let's welcome Repower's AJ. AJ, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm AJ Cheek, and I serve as the Chief Innovation Officer at Repower. Pleasure to be here today. Um, Repower is a collaborative platform that allows transportation and logistics companies to seamlessly share equipment with one another. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, $4.6 million, um, excuse me, 4.6 million trailers in the, uh, across the U.S. Uh, how Repower and our users are managing those 4.6 million trailers are the pieces that they have an opportunity to interact with. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, what the future looks like uh, with a model like ours and asset management um, in, uh, in, in the way that uh, we think the future requires. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are 4.6 million trailers across the United States today. Those 4.6 million trailers are managed or owned by 1.2 million fleets. Uh, of those 1.2 million fleets, 97% of those operate less than 25 trailers. So what that means is there is massive uh, imbalance, uh, massive fragmentation across the industry. Um, and um, therefore, a uh, great opportunity uh, for fixing some of that. Um, what you don't see in the market conditions page here uh, is anything about the freight conditions that we're currently seeing or about the equipment conditions that we're currently seeing because what we want to drive home today is the, this reality and this reality remains a constant regardless of whether we're in a tight freight market uh, or whether we're in a loose freight market. The ownership percentages are not looking like they're going to change anytime soon and if anything they're going to go and they're going to continue to uh, follow a consolidation model. Um, but what does change is who needs the assets, when they need those assets, and where they need those assets. And that's where Repower comes in. So Repower's role in the equipment space is we connect companies that have and use that equipment. Uh, those companies could be carriers, shippers, 3PLs, leasing companies, and OEMs. 
And by connecting those companies, we, have, we provide a platform that allows for shared visibility and we unlock access to equipment that otherwise would not have been available uh, across different parties. Um, we do so practically um, by providing a reservation and chain of custody management tool through our platform that allows our users to engage with one another for long-term leases, short-term rentals, or simply just trailer interchanges. All with the goal of uh, increasing utilization rates for individual companies uh, as well as universally and eliminating waste. So we've been at this for um, practically uh, just about a year. And in that last year, uh, we've been able to onboard seven of the top 10 truckload carriers, uh, the likes of CRST, um, Warner, Knight, Swift, um, and that 3%, there's more, the US Expresses of the world. Uh, we've also probably been able to onboard 2,000 plus um, carriers that fall in that 97% category, the 25 trailer owners or less. And through our platform, we've been able to connect the two. So we've been able to share uh, 1,500 trailers, uh, primarily supplied by the larger group uh, to the smaller group. And then simultaneously, we're bringing at least 2,000 uh, new drivers uh, to those top fleets. So we're adding trailer capacity to those who desperately need it, uh, those who otherwise could not get it through traditional means, leasing companies, OEMs. Um, and we're bringing driver capacity to the, uh, to the larger enterprise fleet simultaneously. Uh, one, just one use case, we had a uh, company during peak season last year who was able to generate over $2 million in additional revenue for their company utilizing trailers that they sourced off of our platform when they otherwise were told by leasing companies and manufacturers uh, that they were tapped out, uh, that it would be at least 18 months until they could get their access, their hands on additional trailers. So the model uh, in our short period of time is proving that it works. So what does the future look like with a shared ecosystem like this? Well, we are not the originators of the idea that the future is connected, it is autonomous, and it's shared, and it's electric. Um, but we do apply it uh, on a daily basis to the world that we operate in. And to borrow an analogy from our autonomous trucking friends, what that future looks like is it looks like a world in which we are reimagining the limited ways that we have um, modeled our utilization. So from autonomous vehicles, they're asking us to rethink lanes as, and replace those with networks, broaden our scope. Um, the future with us looks very similar. Uh, we are rethinking trailer pools. So if that is the traditional method for sharing equipment, um, we are going to take those to trailer networks. Uh, they are connected, uh, they're fluid, they're accessible, um, and they allow max utilization across organizations. So what that does is, that puts the three percenters, because if you remember, um, I mentioned that the market conditions around the, uh, the equipment ownership is not going to change uh, regardless of what the future looks like. So what that does is it puts the three percenters in a very unique position, many of, of you all in this room, um, to leverage those assets in new unique ways and very powerful ways. And if you'll stay with me, I'm going to use one more analogy to really illustrate the, uh, the opportunity that exists uh, with this type of model. So, and in doing so, I ask you to think about, as funny as it may be, uh, trailers as computer servers. So, if you think about the top 3% that own computer servers in the world, um, the Googles, the Microsofts, and, and, and the, uh, maybe the evil Amazons of the world, um, they could have built phenomenal businesses if they held those assets to themselves. They could have built even bigger businesses and bigger ecosystems if they shared those assets, those servers, uh, the data centers with their trusted partners. But think about the opportunity they created, the world that, we sit, that has provided much of what we see around us today, uh, that they created by leveraging those assets to networks and opening the door uh, for anyone and everyone to use them. The opportunity is very similar for the top 3% who own the assets in the trailer world. Uh, and that future is very bright, and that future is accessible. Thank you. All right. I'll just hand it over here. Thank you very much, AJ. Uh,
The last startup of the day, but definitely not least, is Arkestro. Uh, please uh, give a well, warm welcome to the founder and CEO, Edmund. Hey, everyone. My name is Edmund Zagrin, and I want you to raise your hand if you or a colleague of yours has experienced a material shortage or a spare part shortage in the last two years. We are Orchestro, and I'm here to share why I think that predictive procurement orchestration changes everything. First, I want to say thank you. Uh, not everyone that does digital transformation is laser focused on procurement, but I hope in the next few minutes you will find something in the procurement process that's genuinely exciting from a digital transformation perspective. A little bit about me. I was a procurement consultant helping large companies build digital processes around supplier negotiations, essentially collecting quotes and proposals, comparing them, and reaching allocation decisions. And earlier this uh, year, we had two things that happened from the analyst community. Gartner named us a cool vendor, and Spend Matters, which is the leading analyst in our space, recognized us as a leader. And that actually got the attention of someone who'd started a company called Ariba Technologies. Uh, back in the 1990s. And he'd gone on to be the first investor in LinkedIn and largest shareholder in Bloom Energy. And he said, wow, what's so special about Orchestra? What are you all doing differently that some of these other systems aren't able to access? And I said, well, why don't you talk to our customers? Because our customers are seeing millions and tens of millions of dollars in cost savings in markets that are short, fast moving, disrupted, and constrained. And so one of the things that Rob found out when he talked to our customers was something that BASF had done when they began their journey in predictive procurement orchestration. These are fasteners. And you might not think that there's a whole lot of enterprise value or EBITDA in fasteners. But what BASF had found is using predictive procurement orchestration, they were able to save 590,000 euros on a 3.6 million euro contract. But the most remarkable thing was that this was across 5,000 unique SKUs. It had taken four FTEs eight months to settle the price agreement, and it happened in less than two weeks. And the most impressive part of this was no supplier had to log into an app. There was no user adoption. There was no learning curve. And the leadership at BASF said, wow, <laughs> this is pretty cool. And customers across our portfolio see meaningful business results in under 30 days, whether it's in the automotive space, the food and beverage space, the chemical space, even high tech companies see these results. And it's not always about cost savings. Sometimes it's about supply chain resiliency or performance. And other times it's about aligning corporate spend with clear goals and initiatives. What's the difference? We enable procurement to use machine learning simulations. It all lives in email, so there's no change adoption. And it orchestrates the complete back and forth for every process, from the most complex strategic sourcing event down to tail spend and day-to-day -day purchasing activities. Our secret sauce is the marriage of behavioral science, game theory, and predictive machine learning. Using basic tenets that motivate consumer behavior, we have shown the ability to transform supplier networks into massive sources of enterprise value. And it allows teams to move faster, locking in capacity, delivering a two to five X list on savings, and aligning spend with corporate initiatives. And that's what our mission is, to amplify the impact of procurement's influence in any enterprise environment. We are built to be embedded in every major ERP system and procure-to-pay system that exists. And our configurable orchestrations address 100% of enterprise spend for every form of value leakage. And that's why our team's been growing. And not only have we brought together top talent from Salesforce's Einstein Machine Learning Initiative, but we actually have brought together a huge uh, team around data science and machine learning solely focused on procurement and supply chain to solve configurable, customizable challenges in every industry vertical. And that is why we're excited about procurement, and we think you should be too. So thanks so much, everyone, and I hope you all have a great day. Cheers. Very nice. All right.
Thank you very much, Edmund. Uh, that wraps up the startup portion of the day. Uh, and now I have the pleasure to welcome Bart Gabil uh, from Savannah, Georgia. And I think he was over there, Nelson Peacock, uh, here from Northwest Arkansas, to talk a little bit about economic development and how that can really drive uh, local innovation. Yeah, I'll come up on stage. All right, so um, let's start with the guest. Um, Bart, could you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what's going on in Savannah? Uh, yes, very much. Uh, well, thank you very much for having, having me here today. Um, I'm Bart Gobiel. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Logistics Technology Innovation Corridor. Uh, it's based in Savannah. Um, and I wanted to thank Plug and Play uh, and thank my, uh, my panelists here for doing such a wonderful day, you know, wonderful job on a Chamber of Commerce day outside. Um, we're, we're truly blessed to be here. So what we're doing in Savannah, uh, Savannah continues to grow. Uh, the Port Authority in Savannah, um, as we might get into a little bit, <clears throat> continues to grow as well. The Southeast continues to grow, which is served uh, by the Port uh, of Savannah as well as uh, other ports in the Southeast. And so we realize with the tremendous growth, our, our warehouse and industrial market went from about 40 million square feet to 110 million square feet in about six years. And so with that growth, with other growth, with people moving to the southeast, we realize, okay, we need to prepare for the future. Uh, and part of that is realizing that it's not just that kind of bricks and mortar and building out roads and building out that infrastructure, that traditional infrastructure, but really building out logistics technology uh, and bringing in innovation uh, to, the, uh, to the world. So uh, what we're doing, we're partnering up with our local economic development authority. Uh, Georgia Southern University is our research university in southeast Georgia. Uh, Georgia Power is on board. The Port Authority of, of Georgia is on board. Uh, we have some warehouse folks on board as well. Uh, and so we're excited to uh, start our program uh, in late June. We're excited as well. Nelson, over to you. Yeah, thank you. And am I on here? Am I on here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone uh, for uh, having me here. And welcome to, to Northwest Arkansas. I don't know how many of you have actually been here before. Uh, but this is a really exciting uh, part of the world. Obviously, you're getting to see Bentonville, which is amazing, uh, anchored, obviously, uh, by Walmart and other startups that are coming here. But uh, Springdale has Tyson Foods, Rogers Lowell has J.B. Hunt, and Fayetteville has the University of Arkansas. So it really forms a collective uh, region and ecosystem here where everyone uh, collaborates and, working and works together. The Plug and Play Initiative uh, is really a key part of that. Um, our economy in Northwest Arkansas is one of the fastest growing uh, in the country, uh, fastest population growing as well. But if you dig a little bit deeper, uh, we need to do more around innovation, uh, uh, bringing in startups, scaling startups to make sure we grow economically in the future. That's what this is designed to do. And I think for those of you that come here, you'll find a very collaborative uh, ecosystem, uh, a lot of support for startups uh, and a lot of opportunity in Northwest Arkansas. Great. Um, Nelson, could you maybe talk a little bit about um, what prompted you to really embrace uh, startups, entrepreneurs, and how innovation has become a part of uh, your economic development strategy? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned, you know, the economy is really strong. We are uh, grounded by these anchor companies, Walmart, Tyson, J.B. Hunt, Simmons Food, others that are doing really well and have been throughout the course of the pandemic. Uh, but we need to work on our innovation score. We need to continue to grow the economy, you know, five, 10, 15 years out. And so we're really focused on, on that uh, for economic growth in the future, but also for talent as an ecosystem. We need more talent uh, to develop here and to relocate here. That's gonna help our enterprise companies, but also the younger startups as they recruit and attract talent uh, to Northwest Arkansas. Uh, last week we had a call and you mentioned uh, the mission of the Northwest Arkansas Council. Uh, is that still relevant uh, from, what was it, uh, 40, 50 years ago almost? Well, well, I, well, this my organization is a regional uh, economic development organization, actually started by Sam Walton, who called his buddy Don Tyson, and they called their buddy J.B. Hunt, and they got together and basically said, you know, these smaller towns, and they were all about half the size they are now in the early 90s, we need to work together to provide a uh, region where we can all, our companies can grow. And back then, it was physical infrastructure. So they focused on the airport, 
roads. Uh, there was a big water project. And over time, uh, we transitioned to workforce development and economic development, quality of life. You've gotten a little taste of that around here, investing in our downtowns and green space. Uh, and so it's still the same. It's how you work together uh, to create a good business environment. But the mission is slightly changed as we've grown and changed as well. Great. Thank you. Um, I would say that Savannah is a, a, a beneficiary of what happened during the pandemic in terms of people relocating, uh, finding um, a new place to work remotely from. Actually, our colleague Kian Karimi, who helped spearhead the initiative, was one of those uh, expats from Silicon Valley. Could you uh, talk a little bit about uh, how that has affected uh, your work? Sure. Yeah, uh, Keon's uh, the spokesperson for Savannah, really, um, abroad, and we, we appreciate it. Um, and we appreciate him really introducing us into, into the plug-and-play community. Um, you know, we, we have uh, benefited tremendously uh, from folks who have relocated. Um, we offer a, a, a small incentive for f people in the, um, the tech industry to, uh, we help them, it's about $2,000 max to, to move into the community, um, you know, if you're qualified. Um, uh, 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 if you qualify for it. And so, but on top of that, what's really been neat is that we're starting to see a lot of our talent come back to Savannah, um, where people have gone abroad and said, you know what, I want a better quality of life, mm. um, whether it's a bigger city, whether it's um, overseas, and we can work remotely, we can do different things, we can share. Uh, and so we've really uh, seen a lot of our homegrown talent that once left as we have evolved in the Savannah region, um, and people want to come back for that quality of life uh, from the weather is beautiful, you know, you're on, you're on, the, on the water, um, and you're not too far from a couple of big cities, Atlanta, Charlotte, Orlando. Uh, and so we've been really able to uh, attract that talent. Um, and we've got some folks who just kind of like randomly called us up and like, hey, I, I relocated from New York and, you know, I work for Facebook, and, you know, now Meta. Um, and we had a gentleman who heads the Meta operations for uh, a major consulting company out of Boston um, who have relocated. And they just called us up and like, hey, we want to help you grow. We want to be part of what you're doing here. Uh, and we see the future, you know, 15, 20 years down the road. That's great. On the topic of uh, quality of life, uh, that is one of the big uh, benefits of uh, living here in Arkansas. Um, but when I drove down, uh, downtown yesterday, uh, I saw a lot of construction going on, uh, which is a great sign of the council doing successful work. Uh, that amount of growth um, also brings certain challenges with it. How do you balance that and still maintain uh, the quality of life for the folks here? Yeah, well, one of the great things about here, if you're coming in from New York or California, is you do not have to spend an hour in your car every day. Uh, that's one of the great things uh, about uh, being here. Uh, but as we continue to grow, uh, those challenges will uh, get a little bit worse. Uh, again, when people slow down to 60 on the highway, they think it's a traffic jam. So a little, little perspective from the locals would probably be helpful. Uh, but uh, our housing prices are growing. Um, uh, you know, we're still lower than the national average. Uh, I think we need to do a lot of work around that. We need to build more housing, not unlike uh, other places. And I think balancing uh, growth uh, while continuing to recruit business and talent to the region and maintaining the character of, of our, all of our small towns will be the challenge for my organization and others uh, going forward. And I, I don't know of any community that's gotten that right yet, but we're gonna do our best to do so. Um, on the notion of growth, um, you mentioned that the port doubled in size um, over the last decade, from 3 million TEUs to now over 6. Um, what challenges do you see popping up? How do you work against those or with those? Uh, what's your approach there? Um, that was a great question. And they, they recently, the port recently announced a, an expansion project to actually get it to 9.5 by 2025. Um, and so they have a, a, a CapEx program of about three and a half billion dollars uh, over the next 10 years. Um, and a lot of that will go to land purchasing, mm -hmm. um, you know, your, your, uh, your, your kind of your terminal uh, infrastructure. Um, but we're, we're also kind of seeing, I was reading, getting ready for the panel, um, there's about 9,000 cargo vessels worldwide. Um, mm -hmm. And right now, a fifth or 20% 
of those are anchored offshore globally. And so, I mean, as, as the mayor skies and Crowley knows, I mean, that's, that's how do you get that product? And then you're starting to see that trickle back from China into the United States. So it's really, how is that transparency? How do we have predictability to the retailers, to the OEMs of the world? Um, in bringing in that innovation in the, as we grow, not only organically in the Savannah market, but as the way that we you know, order, order products and consume products, how does that intertwine to this whole new paradigm? Mm -hmm. And so the key to it is innovation. Um, workforce can only go so far, um, and we need to keep on providing that. And it's really cool to see that the, a lot of the trucking side of things today um, and, and also <clears throat> the whole supply chain. We're going to be focused on the first mile, but as we grow, uh, we need to look at things differently um, and really think outside the box and as corny as that kind of saying is, but, you know, we really, uh, otherwise we're just going to keep on doing the same thing and banging our heads up against the wall. Hmm. Um, speaking of banging your head against the wall, both of you worked in politics uh, for some time, um, which... <laughs> this uh, wasn't one of the questions you sent us. <laughs> which requires a lot of um, uh, stakeholder management. Um, today on the success story of Walmart and platform science, a lot of stakeholder management. Um, innovation is a messy process. How do you um, uh, address that with your um, uh, regional stakeholders? How do you make sure that everybody is um, um, following the same mission and uh, really going towards uh, the same vision? Um, it's, it's a good question, um, and <clears throat> it's kind of a saying, even though it's on that infrastructure side, you, you know, you, you, really, you can't take politics out of politics, um, and so you have to put yourself in somebody else's perspective and what's important to them, um, and you've seen it really kind of charge up through this pandemic when folks couldn't get the products that they needed, um, and that's uh, it's, it's really energized uh, a lot of uh, the effort to solve the problem. Uh, but we need to do it deliberately and thoughtfully um, and making sure that all um, groups of folks are in that process mm -hmm. and that we're listening to them and we're getting to what they feel is important and making sure that there's buy-in from the communities in which we serve, uh, whether it's building your traditional infrastructure, whether it's building workforce development programs, whether it's you know, education, and it all goes back to quality of life, and how does that improve somebody's generational opportunities to succeed? Nelson, anything to add? Yeah, I don't want to talk about politics. Um, <laughs> I've worked at the federal level in politics. I've worked at the state level. Uh, now, locally, uh, dealing with this, what I've learned is, is, you know, the closer you get to the problem, actually, the easier the politics are. It's normally the people that don't have a stake in the actual outcome or actually uh, understand it. And so what we do is we bring our local mayors, local business leaders, everyone together to really to dig in and understand the problem. A lot of times that will solve it uh, right there. Always there are, with the, especially with elected officials, there are ulterior motives. There, many of them, their first priority is to get reelected, uh, and that doesn't always square with what you're trying to achieve. And so just engagement, more engagement, I guess engagement till it hurts is kind of the philosophy. And sometimes that's the last thing that you want to do on any given day, but it's, it's part of the job. It's critical to do. On the engagement side, you um, mentioned an example last week where you um, were pushing and pushing and pushing for an apprenticeship program to finally get adopted. Uh, we're looking for the right stakeholder. Uh, within a uh, big retailer here. Could you maybe share a little bit about? Well, uh, you know, one of the great things about our group is we have these large enterprise companies here. And with, with Walmart, um, we were trying to find the right person for an apprenticeship program in tech uh, and data science that the state had passed. Uh, and it took uh, a couple of years. We finally got the right person. And we've grown from, you know, 20 graduates they're going to move it up to 100 and then ultimately, you know, four or 500 over the next year. And so able really to scale that. And it's an example of the state passing legislation, f appropriating money, but not doing the appropriate stakeholder engagement to explain what is available to the very citizens that it's intended to serve. And so a group like ours was able to step in 
uh, do the work and you know make all the businesses here understand it. So now we've got the large businesses taking advantage of it and all the smaller businesses too. And so for startups, I mean, you get a free, free body um, and uh, they pay the salary uh, and startup costs for, I think it's about eight months under the program. So it's a really good program. That's great. Um, we're almost coming up on time here, but um, could you share maybe a couple of examples of uh, either past successes or projects that you're excited about uh, moving forward? Um, yeah, yes, uh, um, on the past successes, um, first getting it, the program up and running, you know, and, 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 and to be able to work with Plug and Play and its team uh, has been great, and so I appreciate that very much. And then on the future um, side of it is partnering up with other uh, corporations um, and listening to what they need, uh, but then also, you know, we've heard a lot of trucking. Um, I, I think there's some really good opportunities in rail um, mm -hmm. as well, um, and that's a, uh, you know, a, 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 it, it's a balance. Like in, in Savannah, I think it's about 80-20 uh, truck versus rail, but, you know, so you could further reach into the uh, into the United States uh, from where we're located, um, and so I, I think that are, that's some outstanding opportunities, and most importantly, the transparency, and mm -hmm. because that's predictability, and, and that's, at the end of the day, uh, what you want for your consumers. Yeah, I think for us, uh, this region is growing, but it's still small enough where you feel like you can get things done, and there's a lot of collaboration. Uh, I took a photo of the statement from Sam Walton uh, that said we're, we're working together, and that's really the, that's really the secret sauce uh, here, and so we have a lot of initiatives in healthcare, housing, uh, infrastructure that we're proud of. Uh, when you uh, back it back it away, it's really all about how can this be a better place to live, how can this be a better place to recruit talent so everyone can thrive here. And so it's really uh, an exciting trajectory uh, for startups that are relocating here. Uh, we have a team that will help develop workforce programs for you, make sure you get the talent you need uh, to do the work. So thank you all for coming to Northwest Arkansas. Awesome. Well, it's a pleasure working with you both. Um, Thank you. That's all the time we have uh, for this panel. So let's give these two gentlemen a hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. All right. And uh, to bring it home in style, uh, we have our very own Harvey Williams, principal of Plug and Play Ventures, uh, to moderate the future of trucking panel. All right. Okay, good afternoon. If I could ask our panelists to go ahead and come on up to the stage. We got Graham Dorley, founder and CEO of Solo AVT. We've got Chetan Marichli, founder and CEO of Locomation. And I believe most of you know uh, Craig Harper or know of him. So please come on up to the stage. We are, we are missing a mic. Do we have another mic over there? It is, it is on the floor, okay. Perfect. Okay, so our panel today is really going to be on the future of trucking, specifically aimed at autonomy and uh, electric capabilities. So we are the last panel standing in between you guys and the bar. And <laughs> what I would like to do is if you have a question, Please shout it out, raise your hand, I'll direct it. We can see who wants to take it from the audience. Um, but it's an interesting topic. I think there's a lot of, Saeed, do you have a question? No, 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 I just wanted to say hello. Okay. <laughs> there's a lot of attention grabbing headlines around this space. So we thought we wanted to bring it home with the future of trucking from, from this capability. Um, but first, I'd like to go ahead and ask each of the panelists just to introduce yourself for a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about the organization and what you're building uh, specifically. And we'll start with you, Chetan. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? It's okay, perfect. I'm Chetan Mirishla. I'm co-founder and CEO at Locomation. Uh, Locomation is a Pittsburgh-based autonomous transportation company. We take a lot of pride in being a plug-and-play portfolio company, so go plug-and-play. Um, we are, uh, as our name implies, our eventual goal is to automate anything that moves. But we are starting with a very focused approach. We are focusing on autonomous trucking and furthermore, as I'll explain a little bit later, we are starting with a human-guided autonomy approach. We are on path to be the first company to deploy safely, legally, and routinely at commercial scale 
an autonomous tracking product. Uh, Craig Harper, been with JB Hunt for 30 years, just came off of celebrating our million mile drivers. We had a uh, total of uh, 54 in town, so always a great time at JB Hunt doing that. Uh, been uh, several different roles at JB Hunt. Love being there. It's uh, always changing. I came in 1992 when the company was getting into intermodal. We always say that we'd rather uh, reinvent ourselves than somebody reinventing uh, our company for us. So we're always open to change, looking to be uh, aggressive on new technologies. You know, launch dedicated, launch our um, digital freight matching platform, JB Hunt 360. So always looking for the new thing and look forward to a lot of growth at JB Hunt. Graham Dorley, I'm the founder and CEO of Solo AVT. Just want to thank the plug and play guys for inviting me down. I'm based out of Silicon Valley. And uh, Solo is building a ground up new class eight fully electric long haul truck designed to be autonomous. Uh, and for those who are gonna ask me later, it's over 500 miles of range because I've been asked that many, many times. <laughs> Uh, so we come from the worlds of Waymo. I spent about eight years there myself, uh, my team, and prior to that I was at Tesla. So I think collectively our team spent over 30 years in autonomy and uh, over 50 years developing electric vehicles. So uh, we're really, really excited to bring that effort to trucking. I think it's an industry uh, that we're really going to help decarbonize, got a lot of exciting things coming on. In fact, uh, next week, just pay attention in the news because we will be there too. A lot more to say about that. If you have any more questions, just hit me up afterwards too. Okay. Um, speaking of Waymo, actually, uh, Craig, I'd like to ask you to maybe detail a few more, um, a few more things that you guys were planning with Waymo as you decided to go ahead and, and form that partnership. If you could take us into the, the nature of the relationship and how things uh, really came together. Uh, it all started back in 2016, and I went before the executive leadership team and started talking about uh, electric and autonomous and heard the same things that I heard from the other OEMs, not in our lifetime. That's what uh, people were saying in 16, and I think you got to give a lot of credit to Elon when he kicked off the truck in 2017 because he had the electric truck, but he also talked about autonomous. So people started uh, talking a little bit about it. It's hard to get information. Uh, went out to CES, which I know a lot of you have attended. If you haven't, you should go out there. And that's where I met the different AEV players. And believe I've met with virtually every AV player out there, had them to many of them to our corporate headquarters, written in their equipment. I've been thoroughly impressed with the technology and the advancements that it's made through the years. And when you start looking at them, there's a lot of great innovators out there, a lot of fantastic technology. But it doesn't take you too long to come across Waymo. I mean, they, they started years ago, um, now have over 20 billion miles in simulation, uh, 10 million miles on the road. I would uh, invite all of you to go ride in any of the autonomous uh, trucks or robo taxis that you can and see the technology firsthand. And that's what we started doing and talked to several different companies. And we like to lean on our OEMs a lot. And you can see the uh, OEMs have uh, lined up with some players right now, and that can always change, invite new players. But you've seen that uh, Freightliner bought Torque Robotics, uh, also works with Waymo. You can see Navistar with Too Simple. You can see uh, Packard, which is Kenworth and Peterbilt with Aurora, and Volvo with Aurora, and then Embark is working on a lot of others. And I'm sure we're going to hear about how this gentleman is working with, with folks. So uh, that's how it all got launched. And then we started with a pilot program with Waymo. Pilot went extremely well. Uh, Waymo was pleased uh, with how the truck performed. We were. It performed like we expected it to perform. Customer loved seeing the truck in operation. And it's just uh, really sells you on the technology. When you get to see it firsthand, you get to see how that truck interacts you know, with the flow of traffic and all. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, and actually, he, he teed you up perfectly. So, Chetan, can you kind of walk us through the locomation solution and how you landed on convoys and, and, and where we go from here? Sure. Uh, let me try to give a quick summary of that because I can literally talk about it for months because I've been doing this for decades. Um, after spending a couple of decades uh, building uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, me and my co-founders and a large part of our, our team 
we collectively came to the conclusion that the boring, benign part of autonomous driving has been sold for 40 years. That's not, what keep, that's, that's not what's keeping self-driving vehicles uh, from becoming mainstream. What's really important is when the unexpected happens, when the uncertainty kicks in, when the variability of the real world comes to play. And that is still inherently very difficult for machines to uh, reliably deal with. So building the technology for reliably dealing with the uncertainty and edge cases of the real world is hard. Proving that you actually build the technology for such reliability is even harder. So we believe um, it, it will take a really, really long time and a lot more exposure than a few tens of millions of miles to actually prove the safety case for large-scale, commercial-scale deployment of completely driverless vehicles. Hence, QR, Human Guided Autonomy Approach. We are starting with what we believe can be safely and legally built and deployed today. And we are looking to start uh, offering the benefits of autonomy without waiting for another five to 10 years. And we are also planning to use our profitable and valuable platform of Convoys to learn about the real world at an unprecedented scale, millions of miles worth of real world exposure every single day. That is going to uh, uh, teach our technology to become better and better by every mile we drive. And we believe the compounding effect of that is going to be very impactful. Now, I'd like to, to stick with you just for a second. Um, you landed your first customer, Wilson Logistics, mm -hmm. I believe. So from your perspective, from the entrepreneur's perspective, uh, what was your go-to-market strategy and how did you acquire Wilson as uh, one of the first few customers? Uh, Wilson Logistics is a, a, a great partner to co-develop and uh, be, become one of the earlier adopters of the technology. As we are figuring out what actually needs to be built, we, uh, we were looking for a partner that can actually run with us as fast as we can. The speed is very important. And we also wanted a, a partner uh, that can actually use our technology to grow not just their operating metrics, but also their top line f fast enough so that they can be an exemplary uh, uh, role model in the, in the um, landscape. Of course, when we presented our analysis to, to Wilson, looking to improve their profitability by around three to four times over what they are doing now, and improving their top line a couple of times over what they are doing now, they were genuinely impressed. And after, of course, uh, having seen the technology at play, we wanted to make it formal, and they committed to uh, purchase over 1,100 units from us over a couple of years. Excellent. And we'll, we'll get to the operating metrics in a bit. But Graham, I'd like to go to you next. Um, how are you thinking through the build uh, from the ground up? You know, what's the hard part with sensor, sensor integration for legacy diesel trucks? And what are you doing to make your platform uh, autonomous ready? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So. There, there's like, like Chayton said, I could spend hours on this, right? So as an engineer, I can dive into the weeds, but fundamentally, um, you need to start over, right? And when you talk about autonomy and bringing in autonomy, you know, I, I agree completely. It's it's fundamentally here. Like I saw it at Waymo, and and by the way, yeah, I worked closely with the gentleman that worked with you, so I know I know very well what's going on in the in the autonomy industry. But it, you can't scale it well, right? So there's this fundamental disconnect between what's being built now and the traditional OEMs and what's coming down the pipe. What all of the AI, all of the sensing that's coming, you can't really put it on traditional trucks for a myriad of reasons. It's not efficient. Sensor positions you can't achieve because they're human driven. Uh, and then you have to re-architect the whole platform for redundancy. We haven't even talked about that. Redundancy is extremely important. When you take a human out, right, and you're driven by a robot, who wants to get on an aircraft that doesn't have redundancy? Like it's, it's un, just, you don't hear of it. So, you know, that's what we're really core of our business is focusing on redundancy and building the brand new platform from the ground up, so we can achieve the appropriate sensor positions, so we can get the architecture we need to build an effective autonomous vehicle. Not only that, but also to make it electric, right? When it's the same kind of argument, you could say there's a lot of electric trucks being out there, and the reason why you're seeing 150, 250 miles is because they're old trucks that they just put batteries on. We are designing a battery on wheels, essentially, 
right? In, in early days of Tesla, I picked up the phone and I said, you know, we're gonna build a 300 mile sedan, 300 mile battery electric sedan, and everybody would just hang up on you and laugh. It's like, you gotta change your mindset to what can be done and help bring in that reality with good technology and good design, and so that's what we're doing. Perfect, and, and diving into the operating metrics piece, Craig, for you, how do you evaluate the business case here for autonomy? And then we'll get to electric in a second. Well, you've got to have several things. The, the total cost of ownership's got to make sense. And when you, you look at that, what, what does that really mean? Obviously, the, the purchase price, getting into it, what's going to be the resale of it, uh, what's going to be the charging or repowering infrastructure, what's going to be the uptime, the weight, the, the whole range as far as limitations on how you operate your business. Because many times we see uh, trucks, people stating 250 miles, okay, is that really 210 miles when you are pulling 40,000 pounds? If it's 210 miles, the driver's going to think that's more like 160 or so before they get real nervous because they know if they run out of energy, it's not like they can take them uh, 10 gallons of diesel in a can. You know, you got to get some electrons there. So you really have to see how this is going to fit into your operations. And we've, we've been having problems with that, having problems with the infrastructure. Infrastructure is, is huge because in one example, we had a customer that was showing a lot of interest, but where we needed to charge the vehicle and where we needed to house the vehicle were two different spots. And so we were going to waste like 40 miles a day on getting to and from. So there's a lot of work to be done as far as this whole infrastructure piece. And the range needs to be there because I've heard people say, no, it doesn't. You can quick charge and all. Well, let's talk about when are you going to quick charge? How much energy do you need to quick charge? And what does the utility system need to do to, for you to do that? For us to test two electric trucks out at our uh, location out in the L.A. area, we had to spend $30,000 on the transformer just to upgrade it for two trucks. So you've got to really dig into it about what is the infrastructure coming into your location and what are you going to do with the infrastructure inside your gate. So a lot of challenges to work out. Now, don't mistake me, I think the technology is going to get there. you got people all over the world working on this, from the automotive side to the truck side. And I'm glad they didn't give up on the cell phone back when I had that first phone look like a brick phone. It cost $3,300. I looked it up the same year, a Honda Accord cost $11,000. So, you know, and you had 30 minutes talk time. So thankfully people kept working on it. And now we have a miniature computer. So, and the technology is going to advance more, much more rapidly than it did there. So we're, we're going to get there. The more of the story is though, it's not there today. Uh, we are pushing forward though. Yeah, and I certainly agree. And, and Chet, and from your perspective, I'd like to double click on the operating metrics piece. You know, you've got Wilson, but how do you uh, justify the business case for your future customers? I think Craig hit the, hit the nail in the head in a lot of uh, a lot of ways. Ultimately, you you have to operate in the in in the boundary of how much it can cost, how much value the system is generating, how much of that you are leaving on the table, how much of that you can actually charge the customers, what the system actually cost you to actually build, so that you can also make a few dollars of profit when, you, when everything is said and done. And that is a, a largely a overlooked part of autonomous trucking so far, because everybody, uh, and it's, it's very easy for, when you're a technologist, it's very easy to uh, focus on solving the problem and uh, thinking about the viability as, a, as an afterthought. Uh, we believe that everything has to go hand in hand and you have to craft and engineer from ground up a solution that you know there is a viable path to commercialization. So we look at, uh, from a fleet point of view, we look at traditional metrics like operating ratios, uh, the driver utilization, percentages, asset utilization. Uh, we have, uh, because of our convoy model, we are uniquely advantaged in the drafting and, and uh, fuel efficiency and greenhouse gas efficiency. We have an independently done uh, life cycle analysis showing 22% reduction in GHG. So we are uh, monitoring that and we are uh, looking to see if, if our projections actually match the reality. But fundamentally, it's all about that total cost of ownership uh, envelope the value generated by the system and the difference between the two. And Graham, I'd like to go back to you. Um, what inspired you to go after the OEM play here? Uh, you know, we're, we're about 10 years in, maybe a little bit more into the autonomous life cycle. 
What made you look at the OEM play and think that's where I want to focus my efforts? I, th I think um, when we originally set out, we weren't going to be an OEM, right? And I mean, fundamentally, I come from the vehicle industry. I know how to, you know, we built vehicles. But what we found was when you go out and you try to say, okay, I'm going to make a long haul battery electric truck that's oil and water. Like, there's no way. Everybody keeps telling you that. And you start talking to the OEMs, and I start working with the OEMs when I was at Waymo, and I realized that they don't understand. They don't know how to build an electric vehicle, and they absolutely don't have to know how to build an autonomous vehicle. And so, just to get it done and to really usher in autonomy and bring electrification and decarbonize our freight, we have to do it ourselves. And so that's what we're going to do. And so we, we just can, we built a team that have really passionate people um, to build this truck. And I, I consistently hear the same things. Oh, you can't do it. Oh, they're too inefficient. We can't charge it. You can. It's there. It just has to be done cleverly. There's very good ways to do it, and even using existing technology. There's nothing that we're like creating that's super, super high tech. It's just a clever way of using existing infrastructure and technology to make it happen. And Craig, we had a sustainability panel earlier, um, and I thought a lot of nice things were said. How does the autonomous future, the electric future, factor into the sustainability goals for J.B. Hunt? Uh, we're, we're counting on it. You know, we're counting on going electric. That's that's a big piece of it. A few things: counting on renewable diesel, electric vehicles. Also, we, we're counting on the grid becoming uh, greener, and then also the remaining diesel trucks to have better MPG. So we we need all those things to happen. We all know that we want to find an alternative vehicle. It just needs to have uh, be commercially viable because we all have our sustainability goals, but. To do those, you've got to continue to be here. The company's got to continue to be sustainable. We have all the greatest desires and best wishes and all that, but if the company isn't sustainable, then we can't do anything. But we're excited about it. We've we made a lot of progress, but as an industry, we need to make a lot more in the, the next few years. So I think we're coming up on time, um, but I'd like to ask a question from each of you uh, as we wrap up. What are some of the milestones that are well within your reach you think this year? We'll start with you, Chen. Yeah. All right, perfect. Uh, so this year is, is a very exciting year. By the uh, last quarter this year, we are looking to launch the MVP version of our freight optimization backend with our first customers, effectively helping them reorganize their, their operating model and start seeing some of the benefits from that. Uh, and uh, by the end of this year, we are also putting pencils down on the, on the first version of our autonomous relay convoy. The, hard, the design will be complete. We will, we will pass the uh, critical design review, and uh, we will look to do soft launch of the uh, commercial version of our autonomous convoys by the end of first quarter next year. So entire company of over 130 people now is rallying around this very exciting and uniquely crisp milestone. That's very exciting. Craig? I continue to do some more uh, pilots uh, with autonomous vehicles, and then also on the electric side, take delivery of some of the electric trucks that we've been waiting, waiting for several years to come and actually get them into operation and see how they truly perform for us. And Graham? Well, well hopefully I can, I can help you, Craig. So we're, we, we, this summer, we're actually going to be rolling out our uh, Class 8 fully electric. So we'll see uh, it driving around remotely. So it's not going to have any driver on board. And then the end of the year, we're going to be testing our, our uh, custom powertrain on road. So we'll see that uh, start to being developed as well. So it's going to be an exciting year. Next week, we have some big announcements coming, actually. So. Perfect. Well, round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all the other presenters. Uh, thank you to the audience uh, that was so engaging throughout the day. I have a couple of um, announcements. The most time sensitive and urgent one, there's about three cars illegally parked behind the building and they're about to get towed. So whoever that is, uh, consider yourself warned. Um, the next one, the folks standing at that garage door, please take a couple steps uh, forward because that's going to open any moment. And uh, we're going to have uh, around about 17 of our alumni uh, batch startups uh, there. Uh, not all of them were able to present. So please, um, during networking, grab a beer, grab a wine, uh, and check out their technologies. Uh, finally, 
uh, I want to give a huge shout out, I don't know where she is right now, there she is, to Ariana Agrios, who made all of this happen. Come on up, come on up, come on up. No, come, because we now need all the plug and play folks to come on stage for a team photo. Josh, Said, Mike, come on, don't be shy. Harvey, come on back. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work. These all have um, contributed to the success. And yeah, well done, Ariana. Thank you. It was great. And um, yeah, with that, the gates will open any moment. And uh, happy networking.